Good evening. Welcome to the Bennington Select Board meeting of Monday, April 26th. I am Jeannie Jenkins, chair of this board. I'm going to ask uh, my fellow board members to unmute themselves and please say hello, starting with Bruce. Good evening, everybody. Bruce Lee Clark here. Welcome to the meeting. Hi, Gary Corey. Welcome. Good evening. I'm, yeah. Sorry. Good evening. I'm Jean Connor. Hi, everybody. It's uh, Jim Carroll. Hey, good evening, Sarah Perrin. Good evening, Tom Haley. All right. We are all uh, accounted for, and that's great. Also with us tonight, we have Stu Hurd, our town manager. We have Dan Monks, assistant town manager. Shannon Barsati will be joining us. She's the community development director. We have Josh Boucher from uh, Cat TV. And we have Nancy Lively, who as always takes lovely detailed minutes for us. Also tonight, we have several guests for the land use and development regulation discussion. We will have Catherine Breyers from BCRC joining us. We have Michael McDonough from the Bennington Planning Commission here. And then uh, we will have joining us for the YMCA rates, uh, membership rates discussion, Kayla Becker, who is the Bennington branch manager for the YMCA and Jess Rumlow, who is the executive director for the Berkshire Family YMCA. And so, Jeannie, uh, yeah. okay, I just interrupt. Uh, we also have some planning commission members, other planning commission members ah. that'll join us when we, when we do our, our hearing on the land use. And development. Oh, excellent. Okay. And uh, you, you guys will introduce them at that time, right? Yep. I'll make okay. sure that to, to introduce them and get Perfect. them Perfect. off as panelists. Okay, that's great. So next, I get to read the pandemic statement. And while I'm doing that, Dan, Dan who is our Zoom wizard, will yeah. uh, put the, uh, the viewing information up on the screen. Uh, so due to the COVID-19 pandemic state of emergency declared by Governor Scott and pursuant to addendum six, to Executive Order 1-20, Act 92. This public body is authorized to meet electronically. There is no physical location to attend this meeting. Members are, of the public are encouraged to watch the meeting by uh, turning, tuning in to channel 1085, which is Cat TV, or watching it on Cat TV Facebook Live. If one wishes to participate, you can also join the meeting as an attendee by uh, joining, uh, clicking on the webinar link listed here. You can, there is a live link uh, under the select board tab in, um, on the town website, or you can dial in by dialing 1-646-558-8656 and then putting in the meeting ID code of 894-4878-2346. Zoom attendees can view the meeting, but to be, to be recognized to speak, you must use the raise hand function. And the way that works is if you are in the webinar as, uh, as an attendee on Zoom, you uh, can click on the raise hand function at the bottom of your screen. Sometimes that is within the reactions button. Uh, if you are on telephone, you will raise your hand by pressing star nine. And then when, prompt, uh, then when prompted to unmute yourself, hit star six. When you speak, please state your name clearly and also the town of residence. All right. So, all right. So now let's get on with our meeting. And the first order of business is Jean reading the vision statement. Thanks, Jeannie. Okay, here's the vision statement that we're all keeping in mind um, as we meet tonight. Bennington is a welcoming, engaged, inclusive, resilient community where everyone, regardless of identity, shares in our vitality and benefits from an outstanding quality of life. Thank you, Jean. All right, next up is the consent agenda, which consists of the minutes of April 12th, the warrants is circulated and the updated liquor licenses. Hopefully, uh, for the purposes of discussion, do I have a motion to accept the consent agenda? Yes, Jean. I'll move it and I also have a couple questions. 
I'll, 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 make, I'll make the motion first. Second. All right. Thank you, Bruce. Okay, Jean, go ahead. Um, does anyone remember Richard Spies is listed under um, the people present by video conference for the land, the, des the groundwater redesignation issue? Does anyone remember him being there? I know his name was given as an attendee, but I don't remember him being there on the call. I'm not sure, Jean, but I do know that there was an additional person um, in the meeting that we didn't have the name of. So, so maybe maybe those two were switched out. I'm, okay. I'm wondering, Nancy, if we could go there, back. Right, there, there was a woman um, that was listed who did not speak, but um, this gentleman did. Oh, okay. Hmm, I wonder if he was using Richard's computer. He, he was. It wasn't Richard Spies who was using Richard Spies's computer. Oh, Whatever. Well, there you go. Somebody else. <laughs> that I don't know. <laughs> How would you possibly have known that? But, and maybe it doesn't even matter, but I just. Do you know who it was? No, but we can find out. Why don't we do yeah. that? We Probably can tonight. Out. Yeah, okay. And I had one other question. It's page two, line 54 and 55. It says, we're not there yet. However, vaccinated people will not need to wear masks or social distance and can gather in groups. I'm not sure that that's accurate. We have to wear masks. It's, it's when we're, we're in like someone's home, we don't have to wear a mask, but we're supposed to be wearing them like out in public in the grocery stores and so forth. So I just wasn't um, sure. Now we are, but he said going, going forward, that was what we were headed for. That's why that we're not there yet. Okay. Prelude to it, but I'll change it however you want and your call. Okay. Uh, maybe just add in the future, we're not there yet in the future. However, in the future, vaccinated people will not need to wear masks. Okay. I'm not really, I, I, I don't, I'd have to like go back and listen to the tape to know exactly what he said, but it just, it didn't seem accurate. Um, I think that's all. That's all. Yeah, that's all for me. Okay. Any other any other questions, comments? No. I just want to say I was really happy to see the down payment on the fireworks in the warrants for July fourth. Yahoo. Okay. All right. So in that case, can are we ready to vote to accept the uh, consent agenda? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, great. So we're ready to move on to the next item, uh, which is public comment. So let me go over. I see we have two hands up. Let me, uh, individual ending in 439. Um, okay, how do I unmute them? Okay, uh, unmute yourself uh, by uh, pressing star six. And let me please remind you that um, the purpose of public comment is to allow residents to share information or questions that will be a benefit to all of us. Comments and questions should be for things that are not on the agenda. Please try and keep your comments to around three minutes. And as always, if you have a question, the best way to get it answered is to check with our town manager before the meeting. So having said that, please uh, tell us what's on your mind. Yes, I'm Mary Morrissey and good evening to all of you this tonight. I'm here tonight to report that our Vermont National Guard located here in Bennington at the Armory will be having a deployment in early May. I was made aware of the deployment about a week ago. I believe the lateness for the announcement was due to COVID and what we've been dealing with. Bennington has a very proud history of giving our troops a wonderful send off. And I felt very strong that the Bennington region needed to step up to the plate to continue that proud tradition, if possible, with COVID guidelines. I've been working with the Adjutant General Knight of the 
National Guard and his office to see, first of all, if we could have the send off. And they were extremely pleased that I had initiated the discussion and that the organization for it was underway. My next, next, I spoke with town manager Stuart Hurd to ask if using COVID guidelines, would we be able to actually have this community region, regional send off? Stuart said yes, and that is why I am here this evening to inform you, the select board, and the residents of the Bennington region that, um, let's see, that the, uh, that there are 40 men and women of the unit Bravo Troop Blackjack that will be deployed, will join four other troops of the same size for a total of 200 members of the 1st Battalion, 172nd Calvary Mountain, deploying to Yukon, specifically Kos Kosovo. This is a NATO peacekeeping mission, which has been ongoing for 20 years. Their deployment is for one year. I met with the Chief of Police, Paul Doucette, and Captain Cam Grandy of the Bennington Police this afternoon. I have been in touch with the following to save the day until I spoke with you folks this evening. Uh, the Bennington Sheriff's Department, Vermont State Police, Winhall Police Department, Bennington Fire Department with all surrounding fire departments in the region, Bennington Rescue Squad, all of our veterans groups, the American Legion and Auxiliary, Veterans of Foreign Wars and Auxiliary, Vietnam Veterans, Vermont Veterans Home, service clubs um, and businesses along what will be the departure route. I am now announcing to the citizens in the region and businesses along the departure route, and I will try to get out to speak with each of you so that even businesses and entities along the route hopefully will look to participate. And I am requesting your participation with this military send-off. It will be Monday, May 10th at 6 p.m. That's two Mondays from tonight. The National Guard members will be leaving the armory by bus to Washington Avenue, past the Elks Club, up to Elm Street, turning east to go past the post office, turning left onto South Street, Route 7, heading north through the Four Corners and straight through to the Vermont Veterans Home and then continuing north. Please, for residents and those who are going to join, please join the celebration along the route and not at the armory. The armory area should be for the troops and their families to have, sorry, have their private time to say goodbye before leaving for a year. And I respectfully ask you to follow that. Please come and show your support for our troops and their families. Um, bring your spirit and enthusiasm, bring flags and signs of support. Wherever you situate yourself along the route, please remember to wear a face mask and safely distance in the area you are standing with others. If anyone has questions in the next week or two or kind of what, you know, anything I can answer in regards to this um, send off, I can be reached at 802-379-5439. And I guess I will ask if any of you have questions this evening. Thank you, Mary. Um, that's, I think we will try and be there. That is a select board night, but perhaps we can make that our first agenda item and then resume on Zoom at 6.30. I, we, we will talk about how to do that because we certainly do wanna be there and we really appreciate you letting us know. 
we would certainly love if if it was at all possible being that the armory is in the town office's backyard we're hoping that possibly select board members and their families or whomever might be able to start your meeting a little bit late and possibly be on the town office uh, property with your flags and great spirit to join in this celebration. Okay, I, yeah, I, I, we will talk about that. I'm not sure it's possible and that we are all looking forward to doing that and making sure they get a proper send off. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, and I see we have one additional um, person for public comment tonight, Daniel Stroll. Uh, Daniel, let's see, are you, for whatever reason, I can't, un Dan, I can't unmute. Daniel, if you can. Okay, so Daniel, you're up. All right, well, thank you very much for uh... Let me come on to, to make this announcement. My name is Dan Stroll. I live here in Bennington. I am the manager of the Bennington Farmers Market. Uh, we are going to be moving the summer farmers market location to the Deer Park. I want to let the town know about this. We've uh, we've decided to do this mostly for uh, for visibility and for space. Our goal here over the next few years is start is to start increasing the size of the farmer's market, provide more local food options, um, especially, I just read an article the other day saying that food prices are going to skyrocket with uh, soybean and corn and, and all that going up. So the more we can buy local, the, uh, the better for the community and, and the cheaper it'll be too. Um, so the farmer's market summer season will start this coming Saturday at the Deer Park. Um, you'll be able to see it. We've got the signs up all over town. We've moved our little trailer over there, and uh, we hope to see everybody there. Uh, time will be uh, from 10 to 10 to 1, as we do normally. Uh, we will also continue to provide uh, online ordering for curbside pickup. Uh, that, provided, that proved really successful this past uh, winter season when we couldn't have in-person markets, and a lot of people are still, uh, still very interested in taking, part, taking advantage of that. Um, you can find all the details on our website, BenningtonFarmersMarket.org, or you can give me an email, BenningtonFarmersMarket at gmail.com, and I can fill you in on the details. Perfect. Thank you so much. We look forward to seeing you this Saturday. Thank you very much. We'll see you then. Bye-bye. Okay, Sarah had her hand up. I'm sorry. Go it's ahead, down, but I, she might still want to speak. Oh, I actually had a question for Mary, so I guess it might be a little late at this point. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, um, yeah, um, that's okay. Thanks. Okay. All right. All right. So on to our uh, to the public hearing on the amendments to the land use and development regulations. Um, I guess I'm going to invite Dan Monks, Michael McDonough, and Kat Briers to kick this off and introduce any other members that you would like to introduce to this hearing. Yeah, before we get started, I know Michael's got an introduction, some introductions to make. I just wanted to note that Robert Ebert and Nick Lassoff, both um, planning commission members have joined us. Looks like Nick's away from his, there he is. <laughs> so Nick and Robert are joining us. They're both planning commission members along with Mike McDonough. So Mike, take it away. All right, thanks Dan and thank you Jeannie. Uh, I am Michael McDonough. I'm chair of the Bennington Planning Commission. Uh, and I'm going to be joined on the screen and in the presentation tonight by Dan Monks, uh, our assistant town manager and planning director, uh, and Catherine Breyers, uh, a planner with the Bennington County Regional Commission. Uh, Dan has already mentioned that Nick and Robert are here this evening. Our remaining planning commission members are Charles Kopp and Ken Swirad. I wanna say that we're very excited and relieved to present to the select board and the citizens the final draft of the land use development regulations or the LUDR update for this select board public hearing. This effort is in response to a town recommendation that form-based planning and design be considered for inclusion in the land use and development regulations. In that sense, we sort of recommended it to ourselves 
Planning Commission to Planning Commission. The process began in 2019 with an information session at Bennington College Kappa about form-based development for county planning officials and sponsored by BCRC and the Planning Commission. The town was awarded a state grant, planning grant, in December of 2018 to fund the LUDR update. We selected BCRC as project consultant following development of our project scope and the receipt of requests for proposals. By choice, we focused our attention on the downtown area, formerly the Central Business District, anchored at Putnam Square and radiating through the various commercial and residential districts which surround the downtown. Our scope did not extend to the industrial and commercial rural residential and residential conversation, conservation districts beyond the downtown core. But in particular, consideration was given to the planned closure of the Energizer facility. We made a kickoff presentation to the select board in May of 2019. On March 20, 2020, we canceled an LUDR stakeholder presentation to the BBC Board of Directors due to an emergency town COVID meeting. And from that point on, we retreated to our Zoom screens. In August and September of 2020, we held downtown and community stakeholder Zoom meetings. And in February, we held the Planning Commission public hearing on the draft revisions. Tonight, Catherine will take you through the results of this effort intended to make our land use and development regulations more direct and more illustrative based on form-based planning principles. And Dan will answer and direct any questions which you may have following that presentation. Before I turn to Catherine, I want to extend my thanks to her, Dan, and especially to the planning commissioners for their thorough and extended deliberations and commitment to Bennington's future in developing this land use and development regulation update during a difficult time. Catherine? Thank you, Michael. That was a great, um, a great introduction. And uh, in fact, I feel like I'm going to provide a little bit of the same information, but with visual aid. <laughs> so let me get this presentation uh, pulled up here. Everyone can see what I'm looking at with the screen. Wonderful. Um, so thank you for having me this evening. Again, um, I'm Catherine Breyer, Senior Planner with the Bennington County Regional Commission, BCRC. Uh, we were contracted by the town to uh, provide te technical planning assistance for this project. Um, and I'll just say clarifying at the top, uh, um, well, and I'll say even before that, I know that a number of the select board members have heard this presentation or some version of it uh, several times before. Um, and so I'm going to zoom through parts uh, um, where I can. Uh, but I also know that there are two new members. Um, so I don't want to go too fast uh, to make sure that we're all we're all following. Um, a good clarification at the beginning, uh, the LUDR, I'm going to use a lot of terms that refer to the LUDR, which are the land use and development regulations for the town. I'm going to also say the zoning bylaws, the bylaw, the standards, the regulations. Um, I'm referring always when I say that to the Bennington land use and development regulations, which are the rules that the town adopts to guide future development so that it complies with uh, goals of the community for a vibrant um, place for people to live and, and work. So as Michael said, uh, you know, why did the Planning Commission undertake this project? It's because they told themselves to through the town plan. You can see here uh, a um, policy from 2015 um, to consider uh, better implementing policies that are in the town plan, related policies, through form-based regulations because they're such a good way to accomplish those goals. So what are some of those other goals and policies um, there to encourage more dense and uh, importantly, diverse development within the urban growth area. Bennington's urban growth area encompasses uh, the historic downtown and the residential neighborhoods uh, immediately surrounding the historic downtown where all um, where future de development should be concentrated in the coming years. 
Another policy uh, to be furthered by form-based standards is uh, more opportunity and lower barriers for desired economic development, as well as uh, more opportunity, lower barriers for a variety of housing types uh, within this, this downtown area. So what were the key goals guiding this project? Really, they, they come down to three overarching goals to be realized through the, the tool or the lens of form-based design. The first is to lower barriers to desired economic development. So one way to accomplish that is to uh, place more emphasis on administrative review where suitable. So this is a lower level, um, shorter um, timeline review for uh, developed projects uh, when compared to uh, development review board, DRB review, or um, um, uh, th those type of higher level review processes. And uh, a second way to lower barriers is to relax restrictions in some areas for specific uses um, and in areas where that makes sense and complies with other policies out of the town plan for those areas. Another overarching goal uh, to be realized through form-based standards is the simplification of the zoning bylaw um, for this area. So two ways that that um, has been realized in the proposed regulations is to consolidate uh, regulated uses. So in the area that we uh, focused on uh, around the downtown, there are currently 47 individually regulated uses. And so this consolidation would take those down to 14 um, categories that have comparable um, levels of impact and therefore can be regulated compar comparably as opposed to individually. Um, a second way to simplify the regulations is uh, the proposed consolidation of zoning districts from the seven zoning districts that are currently in this area down to five. And a final overarching goal is to make the standards more user friendly. So simplification certainly um, uh, accomplishes a lot to make the standards more uh, user friendly and understandable, but also introducing graphics and illustrations to help uh, the layperson um, understand what the st standards are referring to and how they are trying to further the goals of the of the town um, can really go a long way to making the document more understandable, user friendly. So I've mentioned that uh, form based standards are um, a great way to uh, accomplish some of these goals. Um, but what does that mean? Form-based standards is an approach to uh, land use regulation, zoning regulation, that emphasizes uh, the regulation of form over the regulation of uses. So historically speaking, zoning has uh, foundationally been about regulating use and, and you know, um, physically segregating uses to uh, prevent pollution, um, nuisances, uh, particularly between industrial uses and residential uses. But as other types of uh, regulations have come online, public health uh, regulations, uh, building codes, fire codes, uh, the need to regulate uses has declined over time, which has actually provided a really nice opportunity for communities to think more about what type of built form and built environment best achieves goals goals for creating a, a place that people want to be and, and where uh, businesses thrive. Uh, in particular, form-based standards are really focused on encouraging walkability because walkability is highly correlated with uh, places where people want to live and where uh, businesses are, are really successful, getting people out of cars and walking. Um, there's a direct correlation uh, for how, how much revenue businesses um, in walkability, walkable adjacent areas make. Um, and so when we talk about what's this building form that Bennington wants in the future, it's helpful to look at this cross section of Main Street, looking down East Main Street from the four corners, we can look at these buildings, what are qualities about this built environment that, that um, make it a place that people want to be, we can see that buildings are pulled up all the way to the sidewalk, so when we talk about a setback that's in the case of downtown Bennington, a zero um, foot setback that pulls buildings all the way up. This helps frame this pedestrian corridor that you can see these folks are walking down, um, frames it, makes them uh, uh, feel like they're, as planners like to talk about, in an, an outdoor living room. Um, another term that's a new term in the regulations is glazing. So you can see these transparent windows. That's what glazing refers to. And uh, that's another aspect of, of building forms 
that um, where there is, is high levels of glazing, um, so minimum thresholds for how much of a facade is transparent window, there's a higher likelihood of, of economic uh, vitality and success in um, stores um, that have that high glazing. Other aspects of, of physical form that are desirable, you can see these buildings are tall and having say a minimum height uh, really encourages uh, another aspect of building buildings building form and use, which is mixing uses. So we have these apartments above commercial uses. Um, those are desired because they add to the number of people on, on, uh, on the street, which again makes it a vital, exciting place uh, to live. It also better supports those um, businesses that are on the lower floors. Mixed uses, mixed use buildings, buildings that are, are designed to be well adapted to mixed uses over time, they, uh, they can outlast the initial uses that go into a building. Um, we know that tenants come and go, whether they're residential tenants or commercial tenants. As they come and go, if we have building forms that encourage this walkability, that accommodate mixed uses, they're much more likely to be resilient over time. Um, again, contributing to the overall economic vitality of the community and creating this built environment from the buildings to the public realm itself with trees. Uh, that that's walkable. That's another reason, as Michael alluded to previously, the place where form-based standards are best suited are in this downtown area where it is walkable and the form-based standards approach is, is um, less appropriate in more rural um, and industrial areas. So where was the focus of this project? It's been, again, around the town center and the town center is just a term that we have been using for the purposes of this project that refers to uh, the, the downtown, you know, the most central current district, which is the central business land use district through the uh, residential areas surrounding. So the village residential zone um, stretches out there. And, and so from the four corners intersection out through the village residential, uh, there are currently seven land use districts in this area. And how did the planning commission go about this process? Um, it's important to note that the starting point was with the existing regulations. So this was not a process that started with a, a clean slate. The starting point was to take the existing regulations for the seven current districts downtown. Um, the Planning Commission first reviewed how uses are regulated in these areas and how well um, that's, that's functioning. As I've uh, alluded to before, that was when we found that there were 47, there are 40, 47 individually regulated uses in this area. And by, uh, by looking at them and, and sorting them into categories of uses that have a similar impact, that really um, introduced opportunities to relax restrictions on uses that when you're looking at them individually, they might seem pretty different. But once you start to categorize them, you realize that you know, professional um, services and offices actually have pretty similar traffic uh, um, and other um, impacts. And so regulating them in a similar way rather than differently makes a lot more sense uh, from that approach. So after looking at uses, the Planning Commission looked at form, again, starting with uh, what's currently regulated and how in these areas, what works well and where is their opportunity for improvement, and then translating the, the standards into illustrative graphics. Finally, after looking at the use and, and the form standards um, individually, uh, the Planning Commission went back and looked at zones overall for this area. And that was when they realized that, you know, looking to the future, there are actually three uh, land use districts that have very similar um, uses and built forms that are desired going into the future. So that's where um, there's a proposal to consolidate three districts into one, which would take uh, this town center from seven current land use districts down to um, five um, land use districts. And finally, again, as Michael mentioned, late summer, early fall of last year, when the Planning Commission had a draft um, document in hand, um, there was a stakeholder outreach process to get input on, uh, on the draft proposal. So here's a nice glance at uh, the products of the process overall. I find it helpful to see them all in one place. Um, there's two maps resulting from the process. So here's the land use districts map showing, uh, again, these five proposed districts, the downtown mixed use one and mixed use two the mixed residential one and the village residential. And then accompanying that are uh, the form-based areas. 
So the, um, these land use districts uh, will regulate uh, uses and these form-based areas will be regulating form. And so the, the three form-based areas are the downtown, the mixed use, and the residential. For regulating use, uh, we have a summary matrix table and then accompanying uh, tables that add, uh, uh, provide supplemental standards to complement, and then a summary table of how um, we propose, proposed moving from those 47 individually regulated uses into the 14 use categories. And then the three form-based areas here are broken down into standards for the downtown, the mixed use, and the residential. And finally, um, for accessory apartments, there are some new um, standards uh, that are statutorily, statutorily required as of last year. So those have been integrated um, as well as graphics um, to help people see where um, infill housing can uh, occur through accessory apartments. So just zooming in, uh, uh, helpful to explain that while there are uh, two maps for the land use um, regulation and then form regulation, uh, we've tried to keep it as simple as possible. The, the district lines um, correspond perfectly. So the downtown land use district is entirely within the downtown uh, form-based area. The mixed use one and mixed use two uh, land use districts are within the mixed use design area. And the mixed residential one and the village residential land use districts fall entirely within the residential design area. And just so you can see where the proposed uh, zoning district consolidation would occur um, today, this is Benmont Avenue, this is um, North, um, North Street, and this is Main Street. So today we've got the urban mixed use, village commercial, village industrial, right where the energizer complex is, and village commercial. And these were the, the three zones that the planning commission looking, looking into the future and not into the past really realized that uses and form um, will, be, will be very similar. Um, so this is the proposed consolidation of those three districts into a single mixed use two uh, district. So for the regulation of, of uses, again, here's where we get into the details. Uh, we have the summary matrix. We have the five land use districts across the top and the land use categories along the bottom. We've color coded them so you can see at a glance which of the form-based design areas apply for these, um, for these uh, land use districts. So as an example, we'll look at uh, if I want to develop a multifamily residential home in the downtown. And what I see when I look at this table is that if I want to uh, build, uh, 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 develop a multifamily residence in an existing building in the downtown, all I need is zoning, uh, the zoner administrative uh, person's review to uh, carry that forward. Now, with you can see here with the description of what BA means, if I am proposing a brand new building for multifamily, then that actually does go to the DRB. This is a feature clarifying actually what the current regulation is um, in the town. Hopefully it's a little bit clearer here um, with this making it explicit. So I found that if I want to put a multifamily residence in an existing building, um, that's facilitated by a zoning administrator review. Um, but there is this additional sign, which means that there are some additional standards that apply. I would go here to this supplemental table to see that ground floor dwelling units are not permitted to front on South, North, and Main Streets. Um, and so that's how I would use this table um, to, to figure that out. There are additional supplemental standard tables uh, that, that follow for the rest of these land use districts. So that was land use um, and, and how we would navigate that with these new regulations. Now moving on to form when I want to understand uh, how a, a new proposal is gonna be regulated in, in building form. This is where I'll be directed. So again, staying in the downtown, um, there are three areas, uh, um, categories of regulation. We have area principles and characteristics, building and parking placement and building form. So we start with a general description of the principles and characteristics of the area with a, a hand-drawn graphic illustrating that. And all of the graphics um, reference specific standards and, and really provide an example of what that looks like. So for example, a characteristic of the downtown is going to be pr to provide connectivity throughout the town center through uh, sidewalks and other pathways. So for example, a kind of cut, cut back alley to access, say, parking in the rear of, of buildings. 
Um, so that's how that's illustrated, um, that standard through the, through the graphics. Additionally, for each of these areas, there's a building and parking placement graphic showing, you know, for example, what the uh, actually illustrating what the standards are for setbacks for building coverages, how parking areas should be sited relative to buildings um, and side streets, and, and um, you know, little details like like how a building can be set back um, at an angle from a building. Those are all those are all new um, standards. A lot of those are new based on um, integrating best practices from other documents. So for building form, additional uh, standards include you know building heights. What are some of these public realm standards in terms of trees and, and lighting and, and sidewalks? And finally, these glazing uh, thresholds, as I, as I mentioned before, what are minimums for main street versus side streets um, and um, first floor versus upper stories? So moving on to the mixed use area, you can see the same formula applies. Area principles and characteristics are described. Uh, layout of building and parking placement. One thing that's interesting in the mixed use area is this requirement to have abutting commercial uses uh, provide shared access between their commercial, um, between their parking areas to cut down on, on the need for new parking. Um, also building uh, heights and uh, glazing. Um, and finally, the last form-based area, area principles and characteristics for the residential zone. Again, we still, um, even as we get out and things are a little less dense than in the downtown, we're still striving for compact walkable development. We can see what it looks like to, to provide some infill, particularly with accessory dwelling units in these areas, um, but also multi-unit dwellings when they're allowed and, and other housing types such as duplexes. Building heights, glazing um, are all illustrated uh, in the documents and correspond to the standards. So that's my brief overview. And I know um, I've already seen um, folks raise their hand with questions. So I'm going to release my screen share and we can uh, move on to questions. Great. Thank you. I think I saw Jean's hand and Jim's hand. Thanks, Catherine. That was really amazing to see. Um, can you just explain a little bit further on one of the slides? It was key goals. Um, I think the sentence was relaxed restrictions in some areas. I think people may think that, oh my God, what's coming if you're going to relax restrictions? And I, I know that it's not meant to be interpreted as something negative will be coming. Can you just explain a little bit what, what the intention was for that? Sure, of course. Um, thanks for that question. So an example of that is, uh, as, as I mentioned a couple of times in the presentation, this consolidation of uses. So currently, you know, in a, in a given zone, and, and um, Dan is, is more familiar than I am with, with what the current zoning says, but you might have a district in the town center that says that a bank is okay, but a, pharm a pharmacy is not okay. And when you break it out by category and you, and you think of those as similar uses providing you know, uh, uh, retail or professional offices, um, that those actually have a similar impact to each other in terms of you know, parking requirements, uh, people walking and coming and going, not having kind of after hour impacts um, in the same way. And so we might have a district that currently says that a pharmacy is okay, but a bank is not. But by looking at those as, as being in a similar category of impact, now the regulations would say, no, in a place where you have a pharmacy, it seems reasonable to also have a, uh, a bank. So that's, that's kind of the level of change that we're talking about, where things are already allowed and have a certain impact. Other uses that have a similar impact could also be allowed. So, yeah. so if, I'm, if I'm understanding you, the restrictions that used to be in place, they were serving no no purpose there was no good reason for the for the restrictions that that are no longer there because of what you just described so what you might have maybe maybe the right way to put it is is that um again the focus was on really individual uses and so you can kind of get in and only see that one use and and what what you're ideally thinking about is impact and so by thinking in terms of those categories, it helps you think about what's the actual impact in terms of noise, in terms of traffic, and you think less about, well, do we want a bank? Do we want a pharmacy? And it helps you think about impacts. Very interesting. So it's just like a different, a different mindset. 
Dan, did you want to did you want to add? Yeah, I'd like to add. So, so Gina, I think um, Catherine did a great uh, explanation of, of of a good portion of what we did with regard to uses. But I do want to point out that we also took into account that there are some areas, and, and in particular the Energizer uh, area, where uses really need to be changed because we know that it's no longer going to be an industrial site, or is very unlikely to remain completely an industrial site. So. We carefully uh, reviewed and determined what additional uses might make sense in a redeveloped Energizer EverReady site. So that's a very specific uh, zone that we looked at very carefully and we did, you know, I guess we could say relaxed uses, but more importantly, we recognize that it's not going to be used exclusively for industrial purposes uh, in the near future and we needed to allow for uh, other appropriate uses to, um, to be, to be uh, imp implemented in that area as it, as it redevelops. So that, that's a very specific example, but those are the types of things that the Planning Commission was thinking about. And I see that, Michael, you may want to add <laughs> even more to that. Yeah, I'm just going to add one additional thought. Um, we haven't removed the categories of uses in specific areas. For example, we're not spreading what heretofore have been downtown uses into our residential zone. The residential areas still stay intact. Uh, there are transitional areas that basically stay intact. Uh, and so um, I, I want to be careful that we don't leave the impression that Bennington is now a blank slate and anything goes anywhere. That's, in fact, not, just to and that's not what's happening. And to clarify, for instance, in the village residential district, there was no change in allowable uses. So we were very protective of those in town close neighborhoods to make sure that there were no incompatible uses in there. So I think the districts that we really looked hard at with regard to uses is downtown and then the mixed use districts. And we just wanted to make sure that we did what we could to, uh, to improve future use. That's great. Oh, um... Jim, you're up next. I just want to say I know that we have some time constraints on this hearing, so um, so Jim, go ahead. And any uh, anyone else that has questions will want to ask them sort of quickly. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, <laughs> um, a, a general question with respect to uh, whether or not Act 250 had any uh, role in uh, the development of this plan. So um, Dan might have more thoughts about it, but but the first thing that comes to mind with Act 250 is that we did uh, uh, undertake this project with the intent that once the um, proposed zoning is, is hopefully adopted, that the town will be applying for a neighborhood development area designation, um, which is something that is, a, is an add-on designation through the state uh, that can be added on to, the, to Bennington's existing downtown designation. And it, it provides a, a range of benefits um, to encourage particularly housing development adjacent to a designated downtown. And so one of the, uh, one of the supports through that program is to have, say, Act 50 um, fees waived. And they're actually currently exploring what are some additional uh, Act 250 related waivers um, or exemptions that can apply. Dan, do you have anything to add? Well, I, I just would like to make, you know, I think with regard to our downtown, except when we're talking about very large housing developments, we're, we're almost currently basically exempt from Act 250 because we're a 10 acre town. So unless you're impacting 10, 10 or more acres or you have, you know, multiple uh, dwelling units in a project, we don't, we don't typically see an Act 250 jurisdiction um, with regard to most of our downtown area. There are exceptions where we have large numbers of housing units and, and like Catherine said, this, this will be helpful in, in getting additional exemptions or, you know, uh, uh, you know as far as it, it relaxed restrictions with regard to Act 250. Good, thank you very much. Any other questions from board members out there? No, okay. Uh, and I don't see any questions from attendees. So with that- Janie, Janie can I ask a question? Of course. Um, directed at Dean, but uh, I'd gladly take uh, 
an answer from anyone. Uh, do you think it would behoove us to find a different phrase than relaxed standards? Uh, do you think that will put people off or, or concern people? Anybody? Leave it the way it is. Well, I'd have a thought, um, Robert, which is which is that you know it can, maybe it depends on who the audience is, but um, you know certainly to encourage economic development and and make sure that there's a wide range of economic development opportunities and housing types that are suitable in this area. Um, that's really where relaxing restrictions um, certainly has a positive connotation for developers that want to develop and want to. Um, realize the vision for the town as it's outlined in this document, uh, but to do so with the least number of arbitrary, you know, barriers possible. Right. Great. Bruce, it looks like you have a question or comment. It's not so much a question as I'm, I'm gonna echo uh, what Kat was just saying. I think if we can stress that piece of it, then, then it makes much more sense and connecting it back. Uh, and I know this was all under the town plan. So, but making sure that for the purposes of, of developing, uh, making economic development in this area uh, somewhat more simplified uh, would be, which I think that would be what I would stress rather than just the relaxation of particular regulation. Yes, yes. So it looks like it increases the ease of, of moving forward. It has definite economic development benefits and, uh, and also aesthetic benefits. So with that, if there are no more questions, do I have a motion to accept the amendments to the L LUDR? So moved. Thank you, Tom. Second. Second. All right. And so everyone unmute yourself. Uh, all in favor of accepting these amendments, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? No? Thank you. Thank you all. That was a great presentation as always. And and Gina, thank, you to, thank you to the select board. <laughs> and thank you to the planning commission for all your hard work. And Catherine, thanks for sticking with us for at least an extra year than you expected. But we really appreciate your hard work on this. So thank you very much to everybody. Great, thank, thank you, you guys. All right. That was great. And so next up, we have another, um, I think really fruitful conversation. Um, we have with us Shannon Barsetti, um, Kayla Becker and Jess Rumlow to talk about uh, membership rates for next year for the YMCA. And I am looking for who would like to start this conversation. I'll start. Okay. Good evening, everyone. And thanks to the Planning Commission and to CAP for all of your work. That's, I think that this is very exciting to see uh, moving forward. So um, tonight we're, I'm happy to introduce Jess Romlo, who's the Executive Director of the Berkshire Family YMCA and Kayla Becker, who's our Bennington Branch Director. And uh, I think it's been at least two years but the, the Berkshire Family YMCA has been managing our town recreation programs uh, through the rec center and beyond. And one of the things that the select board tasked um, Kayla and Jess with was to look at rates at the rec center, um, given that um, the Y is expanding programming and staffing. Um, they took a look at rates and came back with these proposed changes. So I will pass it on to Kayla, would you like to get started? Sure, thank you, Shannon. Um, I am going to jump into the rates. I just wanted to um, make a plug that we just started spring programming and um, it was a pretty impressive stat that we have 97 um, youth currently partaking in various programs, um, not including swim lessons, that's another 60. So very exciting. I just wanted to start with that and say thank you so much to the program staff. Um, and then I do have a document um, that I need to share on the screen to help guide the discussion. Um, are, am I ready to do that? You should be, you should be fine to do that. Um, okay. okay. 
All right, one second. Right. I'm gonna share that one. Okay, let me know when I'm good. Yes? Okay, so before we um, really look at it, I need to give a quick overview of what each of the columns are um, to help our discussion. So the gray column here is our current Bennington Rec Center, Bennington Town resident rates. So that is what, if you are a Bennington, Old Bennington or North Bennington, that is what the rate is to join um, the annual rate. The next column, the, um, the Y rate for 12 months. So the Y actually usually does a monthly, but I just multiplied it by 12 so we could compare um, apples to apples, if you will. Um, the next column over is the proposed um, reduced rate given town support. So, um, and then the last column in like the grayish color is broken down monthly. Um, so what we've been discussing is town residents, because the, um, the tax money does go to support the operations, town residents would continue to get a reduced rate. Non-residents would become full Y members and therefore pay the Berkshire Family YMCA rate. Um, so I have that all out there. Um, if you want to know household means family in a different way, talking about an adult um, with children and then adding additional adults um, as family is kind of, you know, who lives in the household these days? Like, let's make it a little bit more open. Um, you'll also notice that there is no senior line. Um, and I can tell you what those rates are, but um, the way of the Y is going to be doing it is an 11% discount which um, is actually right in line with what it currently is. It's just a different way of saying it. Um, and I, I guess, I'm not sure if Jess wants to add anything before we take questions, but I just wanted to put that out there explained. I think you did a good job. I think it's more important to be able to field the questions um, that people yeah. have with this than to really add more dialogue into it as long as, everybody understands what's being presented. Um, yeah. I'm just wondering before we move into that, if you could just go through each membership type and just so yeah. for instance, youth currently they pay $26 a year yeah. um, under the under next year's rates, they would pay $12 a year if they are Bennington, North Bennington, Old Bennington resident. Uh, if they are outside Bennington, they would pay $60 a year. Is that, that's Yes, that is exactly right. Thank you. Okay. okay. Yep. All right. So let's see. I see Bruce has his hand up. You want to go ahead and ask a question, Bruce? Sure. Um, I think I understand what the, my first question is going to be, but just for clarification, since there's nothing on here that says what the uh, effective date of these rates are, my understanding would be that these are the effective, these if passed would be the effective rates for January 1st through December 31st of 2022. Is that correct? Um, I would say yes, except that there's been discussion that they wouldn't take um, effect until their renewal. I mean, I can be corrected on that, Jess, but as far as, you know, if you've paid your year in advance, which the rec center members do, um, I can't imagine that we would like stop them and make them join again, but maybe. Yeah, that's not what I, that's not what I would have meant anyway. Okay. I mean, the rate, when it takes effect for an individual, it's it dependent upon when the individual has to either renew or join. Right. That's yeah. that I'm not worried about. Okay. My question actually has to do with when do these rates become effective? And if, if I'm correct, just um, then it would be January 1st of 2022. Is that, is that the theory? Is that I, 
I believe that we were looking, at, and Shannon, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, looking at July 1, um, our hope is, is that we're in the Ben High location potentially by then, expanding programming further. Um, and so this helps to offset the additional costs we'll have with staffing um, and, and the rental um, fees as we're expanding into new locations to provide more support for the community. But we were looking at a July 1 effective date but it, people would not see the increased charge until their renewal date. So we honor that. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, okay, that, that's, that's actually it as well. Okay, it would be in the future, be really helpful to have that kind of information on whatever your proposal is. Um, my second question has to do with what you anticipate of uh, the increases to result in, in terms of increases in income. Um, do you have an anticipated, um, in as much as the town, our, our current contract with you means that, um, that we make up a difference, um, still not quite clear of how that works, but you know, the difference gets worked out be, uh, between the budget and, and actual money, um, the money that the town is paying. Uh, and your budget that's been approved, that that change makes a change um, in the town support at some level. But so I'm, what I'm wondering about is, what do you anticipate if this is going to be, say, beginning to be effective July 1 of 2021 now, um, what do you anticipate the income to be from this? Um, so it, we were anticipating around, Jess, correct me if I'm wrong here, um, 75,000. Um, and with understanding that that's kind of on the high end because it's a big change. We're not sure how many people will stick with us. I mean, it, that was just really hard to put a number out there. I, um, I've done so many spreadsheets at this point about what it would mean if 50% stayed or 75%. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I could pull it up. I just don't want to go off my screen. So no, no, I, I'm not asking you to do that. But I'm um, so the, the 75,000 is an in a 70 is the high end of the increase. I'm just trying to understand your answer. That's right. right. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And then what we have arranged is that at the end of the year, we look at, you know, we, we operate a break even budget. So at the right. end of the year, if there's a surplus in revenue, it will go to kind of as like a credit when we are looking towards next year's management agreement and um, kind of adjusting that fee based off of the revenue surplus that we have at the end of the year. Right. Right. Well, I would just say, given the, given the, the, the costs of being involved in, in some of the more private gyms in town, this is still a very reasonable uh, fee, it seems to me. Uh, in fact, it's still probably more reasonable than I think it needs to be, but nonetheless. Okay, thank you. And I think one other important piece to note that we didn't note before is that the YMCA does offer financial scholarships mm -hmm. to families. Um, so even if with the, uh, you know, if you're a non-resident, you still have the opportunity for a financial scholarship to support you if the rates are higher than um, your need. Great, thank you. Jean, uh, looks like you're up next. Thanks. Um, can you just dis uh, explain under discounts the pay in full? Um, yeah. 10% discount. And then um, this is something I think I've mentioned before. And I'm curious if you or anyone has done any research on the corporations where, you know, there's our members that are getting the corporate discount. Um, I really think there's a trend that insurance companies, you know, my, my health insurance pays for my membership in full. I get reimbursed 100%. And I'm just wondering if the corporate discount is really even something you need to offer? Because I'm wondering if most people's health insurance plans are subsidizing their fitness costs. Okay, the first question, the pay in full was um, the why does a monthly membership? So if you're to pay the year, 
in advance of the year. Um, that's the 10% discount. Um, and then I'll let Jess speak to the corporate. Um, again, it's I did add in the um, individual MOUs and that was just kind of a baseline. So currently right now, there's a lot of corporate memberships. There's not um, any formal documentation on how they were created or what the guidelines were and they haven't really been updated. They've just been continued. So what we wanna do is um, look at the, the so the why does it in two ways. We do 10% for some of our local large um, businesses. Um, so uh, General Dynamics or Berkshire Health Systems gets a 10% discount, the city of Pittsfield um, and the city of North Adams for their employees um, and being part of our community, it's 10%. But we also have the opportunity to have conversations and uh, that's where the MOUs come in. We have some organizations, um, one would be uh, <coughs> Berkshire Theater Company. They get a lot of seasonal um, actors and actresses to come in. They want a place to work out. So we offer them um, complimentary or discounted memberships, but then we also uh, get the opportunity to see plays. We partner with them for camp field trips um, and different things. And so it's more of a give or take on how these community agencies can support um, the Y and the rec center and the town. Um, but then, you know, it's a little, a little bit more of a mutual, um, understanding, um, and what we're receiving. And so not just everybody gets this discount just because you're a business in the town. So we can have more conversations about how we support one another and really become corporate partners. Um, and then, um, I'm looking at what you, and so what we would like to see is more of a conversation with our partners in the community and how to work together. And that's where we see the corporate discounts coming into play, but more of a case by case basis and really kind of recreating those relationships. Um, Kayla meeting with them, going out into town and um, really figuring out what that can look like. If that answers your question, Jeannie, uh, long-winded. Yeah, no, it, it doesn't really. It, it, my point is you may not need to give corporate people that work for command, let's just say, if they're joining the rec center and getting a 10% discount and then getting reimbursed or could get reimbursed for a full priced membership, you're, you're, you know, I, I certainly am totally in favor of collaborating with, with businesses. That's, that's a, a fantastic idea. And, and that always should be a goal, but I'm just trying to, I'm trying to just trying to get more money in the door by offering a 10% discount. You might not even need to do that because they're health insurance plan may pay for it without the 10% discount. So, and, and that would be just third party billing. And so what typically we do in Pittsfield and North Adams branches is if someone comes in and says, okay, you know, my employer is going to reimburse me. We just give them um, a copy of the receipt through our DAXCO and then they take care of it on their own. Um, and so usually it's just a letter that we have to provide, but you're right. Um, a lot of the larger businesses are offering um, some form of discount. Um, it might not cover the entire thing, but typically they reimburse the employer or employee so that we're just providing documentation for them. But it is something that we do at our other branches. And so we, we can have those discussions as to whether or not they're needed. And I think that's where the conversations Kayla needs to have and getting out in the community, meeting the larger business partners and starting kind of having that dialogue so that we get a better understanding of, you know, really what these employers need in order to, you know, to promote a healthy lifestyle and how can the why um, be a part of that in their organization. Great. Jean, does that answer your question? Yeah, it, that was, that was better. I just, um, yeah, I just want you to make the money that you deserve to make and not be giving discounts where you don't need to. I appreciate that. <laughs> Great. All right. Any other select board questions before we move to community questions? All right. Not seeing any right now. I see we have one community member um, ending. Let's see. Uh, phone ending in 196. I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself by pressing star six. And please identify yourself and town of residence. Uh, Mike Bethel, Bennington. Hello, Mike. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, well, a couple of points. One, you couldn't get in on the other thing that you did. Somebody called
called me and wanted to talk on with the Mike McDonough presentation. No, you you didn't take any audience participation in that. There but anyway, were, on the record, there were no Mike. There were no hands raised. I know they couldn't get in. They didn't know how to get in. They didn't oh. know how to push nine six. I guess. Oh. Yeah. Um, okay. On the rec center thing, I got a couple of questions. Why did we pay the YMCA an extra sixty three thousand dollars this year, above and beyond the contract? What, you want to ask all your questions? I'm thinking Stu may, uh, Stuart may want to respond to some of these. Why don't you ask all your questions? Well, that was my, that was one of them. That was the one. Oh, sorry. Okay, Stuart, do you want to answer? Sure. Mike. Yeah, and when we when we first uh, began the agreement with the the Y, uh, they looked at our total revenue, uh, which uh included all the revenues from the rentals of the fields and the pavilion uh which of course they do not benefit from uh so they ended up um, basing their their request uh for contract with us on uh inaccurate numbers from anticipated revenue so part of this uh change is to recognize that they were shorted uh, in the first year of the agreement. Um, and the other part is to recognize that there is an increase in the number of personnel that they're bringing in uh, when they finally move into the, uh, the YMCA. I think it was something in the range of $40,000 in a shortfall. And then the other revenue, the other 23 anticipates at least one more full-time uh, individual. I think I've got that right. And Shannon or Kayla, you can correct me if I'm off base. I think it's um, also important to recognize minimum wage goes up every year. And so you're going to see increases um, due to that as well. And then we also have the rental agreement in there um, for uh, the start of July uh, for the Ben High location as well. So those are all things that have been part of that in addition to what Stu mentioned. So then nobody, either Stu or you, can give us a final figure of what it is going to cost the Y to come in here every year. It could be 147, it could be 200,000, it could be 300,000. What no, I'll is that as programs grow and we build revenue streams and continue to grow our programming, the hope is, is that the impact on the town continues to go down. But unfortunately, we've hit a lot of challenges um, over the past two years and things that we couldn't um, necessarily account for. So we wouldn't have assumed we would have been closed for four months this past year and not been able to do programming and things like that. And so all of those right, affect that our ability to grow, um, but Kayla's doing an amazing job at bringing in new programming and opportunities for the community. And um, our hope um, with the rate increases and the additional programming and things that over the time, over the years, we should start seeing a decrease um, in the amount that we are asking for support from the town. Do you but send no, a spreadsheet? I, I don't have a magic ball and I, I can't tell you exactly what that's gonna be at this point um, every year. So we're still very much in the growing phase of things. Okay, do you have a spreadsheet of how much money is taken in every year so far and sent back to the town so we know that? Like the dues and the membership and the fees? We, we provide the town financial reports um, for review. And Mike, those are, do those are done on an annual basis. And that's part of that true up that, uh, we mentioned earlier, uh, at the end of the year, if they do better than they anticipated, uh, we receive a credit against the upcoming year. If they do worse, they may ask us for additional support. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, I think COVID has, has created some uh, real problems in trying to identify how well this relationship is going to go. But I, I'm, I'm pretty confident that we will see these, uh, the request for town support be reduced over time. Well, the only thing I would recommend is before we have a final idea of how much this is going to cost us yearly, I think I would make a year to year contract, not a three year contract. And I don't think I would get into any contracts with the MAU and the gym. I think the gym should be leased out to the town itself for the times you want, the space you want, 
and then you can then pass it on to the rec center. But right now, no business person would run this this way. You know, a sixty-three thousand dollars shortage. That's half of what you. That's fifty percent of what you planned on giving them. So that's not a shortage. That's that's just a miscalculation of how this is going to go in my mind. Five thousand would be a shortage. Ten thousand, but not half of the hundred and forty-seven in the contract. Well, re remember, Mike, you're misstating it. Uh, part of the, the shortage was about $40,000. Uh, the additional cost is for uh, additional personnel as they ramp up their programs this year. And uh, there is also- well, That should have been in the first contract, Stuart. I don't want to get into that. Uh, no, that should have been no, the first because contract. the first contract, Mike, the first contract did not anticipate uh, moving into the Ben High facility. That is something that- I know about this year. I, I understand that, but that's what I'm okay. saying. You shouldn't be doing that now. They haven't proven themselves that they can run the rec center. So okay. why are we going into another endeavor that they haven't proven on the first one? Well, I that's think my they point. proved themselves pretty well, Mike. Well, a $63,000 we shortage. That's all right. Yeah, 50% 50, 50 of the budget isn't a shortage. So, and why they're hiring and why they're short when we had COVID and nobody's using it, that didn't make much sense either. But taxpayers are, I hope, watching, but maybe they're not. Maybe they don't care how much you spend. Mike, can I you ask know? you, do you have other questions? No. I, I, when are you going to go back to the regular meetings? Because this is impossible for anybody to call in. Um, <laughs> probably not until after the emergency pandemic order is, is lifted. I but, thought that was going to be lifted in May. Uh, I, I, I think the gov governor is focused on July 4th, Mike. Okay, so if Mike, do you have any other questions? Yeah, I'd like to see, can I get a printout of how much money they've raised so far through dues and fees from the town of Bennington? Can I get that from them through Freedom of Information? Stewart they got public records now that we're in, in, in with them with a contract, correct? So everything they have is public record, correct? Well, I, I don't know about that. I'm not gonna make that kind of a legal I'll ask the, the head of the YMCA. We, we can we can show you what they what they made through December thirty first, uh, twenty uh, twenty twenty, and we'll share that. You with can you. ask the lady that's the head of the YMCA. Are your records open to the public, or will we have a contract with you? As a nonprofit, our our records, you know, through our audit and things, are are made. Um, official and I, I'm happy to work with Stu on making sure that he has the information that he needs, but I would be sharing the information with Stuart as he's, uh, you know, we're in a contract with the town. And so- Well, once uh, you share them with Stuart, then they're public. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. Bye-bye. Bye. All right, it looks like next up is Mike Leak. So Mike, see if you can unmute yourself. There you go. Perfect, great. Uh, thanks for having me on. Um, just as someone who uses the rec center on uh, multiple times a week, I appreciate all that um, the YMCA and the town is doing to keep it open for us and safe. Um, a little bit concerning to see that for the non-residents, um, the cost of membership is gonna increase six and a half times. Um, a lot of the people that I swim with, um, a lot of the people that use the facilities don't live directly in Bennington or the supporting tax base. So just um, wanted to bring up that that's a, that's a really big increase um, to have um, for folks that really rely on the rec center. I know there's this ongoing conversation about how someone who doesn't live within the town, you know, might be able to ask their own towns to, to help support, you know, their residents to come and use our facility. Um, but you know, as we as we just look at that, that's a big concern. I can see a lot of people, especially that I swim with, you know, on a weekly basis, just won't be able to afford to do that any longer. Um, and the other comment that I have is um, to the question that that Jeannie had asked. For my health insurance, I don't get reimbursed for any like uh, gym memberships or anything like that. So um, being able to take advantage of the corporate membership is definitely a plus for. Um, for me. So uh, that's all I just wanted to bring to the conversation um, and a concern I had with that big increase in the, the membership cost. 
Thanks, Mike. I think um, that was a concern for all of us and um, perhaps Kayla or Jess can speak more to this, but what we saw was that there were very few out of town residents who were not um, supported by a corporate membership. So I don't know, Kayla or Jess, if you can, if you can say more to that. Yeah, so we did um, notice the trend that many of our non residents um, were actually paying less than the resident rate because of the corporate membership structure. Um, which I guess is important to note that it would no longer be that way. They would be getting the 10% or whatever the agreement was um, discount on the non-resident full YMCA rate. So that would be a significant change because most of the non-residents have been paying a highly reduced rate. And also I like, I want everyone to be able to use it. Um, and I also want to recognize that it costs a lot to run this facility. It's an amazing asset in the town. And um, what we've been trying to do is to really get um, people to see the value of it. Um, and you know, what, what you can afford um, is individual, but it is a great asset that does cost money to operate. Jeannie, you're mute, muted. Mike, did you have another question or are you just, there's oh. that old hand? No, I'm sorry, I, I just turned it off, sorry, thanks. Okay, all right, that's fine. All right, so um, are there any more questions? Yes, who on one of us? Jean, you have a question. Yeah, um, this is a long time ago. I can't remember how long ago, but it was before I think we even um, went into the contract situation with the why, I can't remember, but um, wasn't there talk of approaching Pownall, Shaftesbury, you know, wherever people are from outside of Bennington to see if their town would subsidize their memberships? Like, I don't want to say Bennington subsidizes, but, you know, we pay for it in our taxes. They don't. Um, and I, I think there was a discussion about pursuing that option and maybe that's off the table and I just didn't know that, but I just wanted to ask the question and maybe refresh our memories. I believe that it did not get pursued in part because there were so few residents who were uh, non-residents who were not corporate members, but it's certainly something that we could go back out to towns and, and make sure that they're aware of this change and see if they might want to support their residents. I think that would be really nice to do. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions, comments? All right. Let's see. I see one attendee. Yes, Tina. R Tina Cook. Can you unmute yourself? Dan, I may need some help here. Hmm, all right. Tina, I don't seem to uh, be able to get you. Are you there? Hello? Oh, yay. Okay. okay, hi, Tina. Please identify yourself, town of residence. Hello? Mm. Hello. Can you hear Nancy, me? Nancy, it looks like you're up rather than Tina. Okay. Okay. Yeah, thanks. I have several questions. Can you rate can I'm, you identify yourself first, please? I'm sorry, Nancy White Bennington. Before we're talking memberships, we paid $146,000 as a town in our contract last year. I want to know who decided we would go from twelve thousand to seventeen thousand dollars. Where did the money come from, and who made this decision? Stu, are you able to respond to that? Sure. It was the select board that made the decision. We discussed this at uh, budget time. Uh, the Y presented uh, their situation for the coming year. The select board reviewed it and agreed to the 
uh, additional funds. Uh, fortunately for Bennington, uh, there was additional funds in the Recreation Center budget that would help cover this uh, for the final six months of this year, and we budgeted for it uh, for the coming year. But Stu, that's money that should have come back to the taxpayers. You gave them an extra $30,000 last year when the rec center was closed for 10 weeks because of COVID. They couldn't do anything and we didn't expect them to. So they were already ahead $30,000. Well, and I again, they only had half of the people they thought they were gonna have. We paid them $146,000. They kept all the money that the people paid. They had the extra 30,000 from when the rec center was closed. I don't understand how you can have us paying more in the budget year we approved a year ago. We didn't approve $17,000. We approved $12,000. No, That's what the voters it, approved. The voters, the voters approved, yes. The, the, the original budget was approved by the voters. Fortunately, uh, there were additional funds that were approved by the voters to cover some of the operating expenses the Y anticipated. They've not uh, used that, those funds and it provided us with sufficient monies to cover the necessary increase. Uh, and remember, when they were closed down, they were still working. Their personnel were still there. Uh, I believe they suspended rates uh, for or suspended membership so that people didn't lose out on what they paid. So they were still working, even though the rec center was closed. They were still providing some programs for the senior center and other places, uh, still preparing to provide programs for the people of Bennington. So. Uh, you know, and it's a, it's a select board decision, Nancy. It's not my decision. Stu, for the 10 weeks in April, I called during that time. They stayed for two weeks to clean. And for the other eight weeks, they were not serving anybody. The senior center was closed. Nobody was providing services. We didn't expect them to. But you paid them the money, and they didn't even need to use it because they had no customers. The other well, question I've got, why did you set up the system so that when the Y collects the money, it goes into their account rather than the, than the town of Bennington account? None of you can actually, you don't know how much money the Y is taking in. That's a bad business decision. Nancy, do you have any other questions? Yes, Jeannie, you tell me how you can verify how much money the Y is taking in if the money goes right into their account? It should come to the town. It should come to the town of Bennington. Then we all know exactly how much money they're generating. Well, Nancy, I do think that Stu just explained that there is an end of the year process where we make where we look at whether they took in more or less money than they anticipated. If they take in more money, then that's a credit for next year. If they take in less money, then we need to be looking at what we're doing. I think one of the things that we're very excited about in Ben High being added into the recreation offerings for the town is it allows the recreation center to grow programming that they've been unable to do up to now. They now have an auditorium that is large enough to actually do fitness classes uh, that are larger and still safe. They have two classrooms for after school activities. And, you know, I could turn this back over to Jess and, and Kayla and they could talk uh, more completely about this. But I think that what we are doing, I think we are very fortunate to have the YMCA as a partner. This was something that we as a community agreed to do in the 2012 uh, Bennington community visit that the Vermont uh, Council on Rural Development held in this community. And this has been a long awaited place that we have finally reached where we are at the tipping point where the Recreation Center is going to be able to provide us with the full service that we have always wanted to have. So, you know, so Nancy, I think for, you know, all the concerns that you have, I say, please continue, you know, following this. I think, please reach out to um, the town manager with your questions so that he can sit down and maybe, you know, with pencil and paper, you guys can 
can better understand what's going on and understand what the questions are that are not seeming to get answered. But we're, I'm, I'm extremely happy the Y is here. It is good for this community. And um, I am thankful that they've been willing to stick with us uh, as we try and find the, the, facility, the proper facilities and uh, a management model that will work for both of us. Any other questions? Yeah. I called before we voted and asked why the why for three years has provided us no documentation on paper on what they're doing. I want to know how many memberships they sold, how much money did it raise, how many people went to summer camp, how much money did that raise. Our own recreation always provided that information. I should expect the why would want to jump at that chance to prove what they're doing. I, don't, I still can't tell today if the why is worth it. They're getting paid all this money. They're keeping all the money that citizens pay at our taxpayer-funded facility, and nobody wants to provide documentation. Jess, do you have an arrangement like this with any other town where you're controlling a taxpayer-funded facility for recreation? Jeannie, I, I, I'm going to have to step in here and Shannon. Yeah, what stop. Nancy has said is completely inaccurate. All that information has been shared with the town staff and with the board, and it's publicly available. So I, I just don't, I just don't think it's appropriate to allow that misinformation to go unchecked. So I just have to. I'm sorry, I had to just step in there. No, I, I agree, Dan. And I, um, so Nancy, I really urge you to sit down with the town manager and uh, and review the the materials that have been shared over the years with the public. All right, so okay. I'm gonna move and on just, to, okay. I'm gonna move on. I have one more thing. You need to check with, it, with what the governor said early this month. He said elected boards can return to public meetings in May. You need to get back to the firehouse. All and right. I was the person, I tried to call in at the previous hearing. It didn't give me the prompt to raise my hand. I can't believe you just pushed that through most of the citizens of Bennington have absolutely no idea what you discussed and what you're going to be dumping into our neighborhoods. Nobody talked to us about Ever Ready. Our neighborhoods are overcrowded, and you didn't even give citizens a chance to call in and ask, answer questions. Nancy, thank you for your comments. I'm going to move on. Move on, Jeannie. Give the rest of the town away. Thank you. Let's see, Shannon, you have your hand raised. Thanks, Jeannie. Um, one thing I just wanted to point out, I think that when you're looking at that chart and the, looking at the cost for a Y membership, I feel like a few of the comments are, you know, um, talking about, you know, this, this great disparity. Let's remember that Y runs they, they run a Y, the Berks Family Y runs their programs in Pittsfield and North Adams, which have very similar demographics to Bennington, okay? And people pay for Y memberships, and if they can't pay, they get scholarships, all right? The Y is not an elitist institution. This is how much it costs to, to run a facility that has a swimming pool. And at this point, we don't have a gym yet, but we will with Ben High. So, I think if you look at those numbers and think about it that way and realize what an amazing deal the residents of Bennington are getting with their rec center memberships. I think that's just an important thing to recognize. And I think Kayla brought that up in the sense of, it really costs a lot to maintain the facility that we have and it will cost more to be able to offer more, but that's what the people of Bennington want. We want to expand recreation and that's why we brought the Y in. And we paid our own staff before we paid Y staff. But in my experience, since I've been with the town, I've seen the Y do so more. We had almost no documentation um, before of our, of our memberships. We didn't have anything in databases, you know? So this is, um, they've really come in and, and transformed our system, but it takes time. And I, I just want to back them up for all the work that they're doing. I appreciate that, Shannon. And oh. if the select board decides that they want more documentation throughout the year on financials, like we can do quarterly updates, we can do, you know, 
every six months, but whatever is needed, it's all in our system. And that's the benefit of using DAX Cooperations, which is our membership database. And we're able to pull that information extremely easy for you, in addition to what our membership you know, what are our membership numbers? And Kayla did break that all down um, in showing what, who is a Bennington resident, the non-residents, people outside in New York, like all of that information we have at our fingertips based on our database. And so we have been coming in, we have been giving the updates to the select board when we're invited. And we also have been communicating um, consistently with the town in regards to where we are with membership and programming um, and providing those updates. And so um, I feel like we have been transparent and we've been providing what we've been asked for, but if we need to look at that, um, I'm happy to have that conversation, Jeannie. So just let Thank me know. You. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. You have been more than transparent and more than patient. Um, Jean, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, this is just gonna be brief and you know, you can be, not us, you, but people can be happy or unhappy about the situation at the rec center, but we signed a contract and you have to abide and you have to um, pay what you're supposed to pay when you signed on the dotted line. And, you know, I, I'm so sick and tired of this conversation. I really am. You guys are doing a fantastic job. Um, I'm curious, the people that seem to be so unhappy, how often they go to the rec center and use the facility? I, I don't know the answer to that. I would love to know the answer to that question. But um, we signed a contract. We will pay you what we owe you. And we thank you for what you've done for our town. Thank you. I very much appreciate that. And I'm going to give all the credit to Kayla and her team. Uh, they've done an amazing job over this past uh, two years. And um, the growth that we've seen is more than I could have ever even imagined. So very thankful for everything that they're doing and the support that we've continued to receive from the town and the select board. I really appreciate it. Um, I know we are way over time, but I know that Tina Cook has her hands up, hand up and she tried to come in before. And I do not, Tina, I do not. Jeannie, what I can do, I'm sorry to interrupt. I think I can promote her to panelists and then she can participate. Okay. So I'm gonna try right. that. So Tina, okay. if you're Thank listening. You. We're going to try to promote you to panelists and then you hopefully will be able to um, address the board. So it'll be like a swoosh of a washing machine. Here she comes, I think. Okay. <laughs> oh, there's Tina. Hi, Tina. Can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? We can. Yes. yes. You can. Fantastic. You're in. Um, identify yourself and uh, share your, your thoughts. Thank you. My name is Tina Cook. I'm a I'm, I'm Bennington resident. I want to say that the REC is going to be a crucial resource for our more marginalized community. Um, so I'm happy to see that uh, their services are gonna be expanded and I'm hoping that they'll reach out to the homeless shelter and um, discuss ways that we can utilize their services. And I'd like to say thank you to the hard work that they've put in. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Tina. That was a lovely note for us to end the discussion on. So, um, so now uh, I would entertain a motion to, um, to accept the YMCA rates for Bennington for, um, for this coming year. Do I have a, a motion? I'll move that. Thank you, Jean. Do I have a second? Oh, let me do that. second <laughs> there. Like, wake up, guys. Okay, it's so, not working. That's all. It was. Start. Oh, okay. So, can thank you, Bruce. Um, can select board members unmute themselves? And uh, all in favor of accepting the uh, rates for next year for, at the Rec Center YMCA? Can Is we? Can we actually just make sure that it's effective July one? 2000, so it's not next year, unless we're thinking next year is July 1, 2021. All right. Um, which I know is a fiscal year, but let's say Go that. Ahead. All right. Motion to accept the rates beginning July 1, 2021 for the YMCA in Bennington. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. 
All right, so let's take a, a roll call vote then. Uh, starting with Bruce. Aye. Gary. Aye. Jean. Aye. Jim. Aye. Sarah. Nay. Tom. Aye. Jeannie. Aye. All right, the ayes have it. And so thank you very much to Jess, Kayla, and Shannon. And uh, let's move on to our next agenda item. Uh, Jeannie, could I suggest we put the call-in information back up? It's been more than an hour. Yeah, it's time to do that. Thank you very much. All right. So Dan, if you can do that, that would be great. All right, call-in information. So if you would just like to view the meeting, you can do that on CAT TV channel 1085 or on Facebook Live for CAT TV. If you would like to speak, you can join by Zoom by uh, the following webinar link, which you can find a live link on the town website under the select board tab, or you can dial in by phone at 1-646-558-8657. Meeting ID 894-4878-2346. Attendees must be recognized if you are in the meeting in order to speak. Either use the raise hand function at the bottom of the screen or sometimes it's located uh, within the reactions. If you are on the phone, you will need to hit star nine in order to raise your hand and then when prompted, you can unmute yourself by hitting star six. Please clearly state your full name and residence before speaking. Thank you. All right, so where does that take us? What is next? I think I am lost. Um, okay, groundwater. Uh, groundwater reclassification, yes. Yes, how could we forget? All right, so this is a follow-up discussion from April 12th. Um, we're gonna start off with the select board this time, then uh, any staff comments, and then we'll move to community input. Um, I do wanna share two suggestions that we have heard that seem to have some merit. One I think uh, is one that a lot of us have heard about uh, requesting that the town manager write a letter asking our legislators to help with state funding to extend the water lines to all impacted homes as practical and perhaps use some of the infrastructure money that's coming down from the federal government. Uh, the second uh, suggestion that has been shared is that the town and the um, Department of Environmental Conservation or DEC explore whether we could use a town ordinance rather than the state groundwater reclassification as a way to restrict the kinds of um, drilling that could be done in the areas that are covered by the reclassification. Uh, as far as has been determined thus far, there would be no impact on the settlement agreement uh, in doing so. So those both felt like they were suggestions to raise. And then I am sure that uh, select board members have comments as well. So um, please let, let me hear what you're thinking. Anyone want to share? Yes, Jean. I clearly have a lot to say tonight. Um, so um, I think the other, I guess no matter, well, if they get, if the people that get hook, hooked up to town water, you know, that's a done deal. But the folks that maybe can't, or there will be some that probably don't, um, and I'm sure the DEC will do this is to provide them with, you know, all the documentation that they will need in the event that they sell their property to explain in full what this means and what it doesn't mean for them. We had a, you know, we found an oil tank buried in our house and we had to have it removed. And, you know, it was a huge big deal. Thankfully, the state helped us pay for it. But we were told if we don't have this you know, probably half inch report in hand, we will never be able to sell our house. So we have that report 
and you know it's it's our it's gone the tank is gone there was no contamination you know it's a done deal and you know i look at this as sort of a similar situation that documentation is the ticket to being able to sell our house and it's we and 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 the dec owes these homeowners that you know a similar a similar situation and i without a doubt they will gladly do that but i guess i just wanted to make sure that um, i had that on the record that i think that's what they deserve um are you seeing that as something that would go into a letter that we might send to the dec in terms of comments or yeah maybe maybe it's premature to do that until we know if people will be able to be hooked up to the town water supply um but yeah and i, I think they alluded to that or maybe even said it outright at the meeting last week or two weeks ago um, i just wanted to reiterate that how important that report will be um, for them. Okay, all right. Bruce, I see you have your hand up. Yes, um, thank you. Um, I have been concerned about this since we've heard about it and actually a little bit before that. Um, and basically I think I, I see very few alternatives other than exploring uh, all possible alternatives to expand our own water system to to be able to serve as many as as is physically possible to do. And I know that 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 certain areas that becomes a real issue of engineering and cost and therefore cost. Um, so I will strongly support the notion of seeking uh, funding from the state or from the feds through the state. Uh, and I will strongly uh, urge us to, to try to find ways that we can to expand our current system. Uh, and, and knowing that, that, that there are, you know, some homeowners will take the option of just using their well uh, and uh, because they can. Um, I also, I, I would agree with Jean, um, the letters that, and I can't remember the term, there was a, a slight term of art that uh, I can't remember, I think it was Richard may have said, uh, used uh, with regard to uh, at the time of sale. I actually think that uh, some communication ahead of time that also says, by the way, when you do come to the point of sale, we'll also send it to you again. So you, you don't have to be like Gene and holding on to this packet of material in some safe deposit box somewhere. Um, it's just really important for the sale of those houses. The fact of the matter is, St. Gobain and its predecessor corporations polluted the land and polluted the water. And the folks who are residing there in our town and in the neighboring towns are not at fault and therefore should be held as harmless as is humanly possible. And that's what I think we need to make sure that we express that that we understand that that the sale of those properties eventually uh, need to be accompanied by the hold harmless type of letter that DEC can provide, and we should be seeking to expand uh, the water system because our job, it seems to me, as a town, is to provide clean, potable water wherever we possibly can. And I know that creates all kinds of other issues, um, but I think that's the best way to go. Thank you. Thanks, Bruce. Um, Gary, what are your thoughts? Um, the, I, I asked this question before, but what, what the uh, last week, uh, two weeks ago, um, was what is the impact of the new regulations in terms of costs for somebody. So if they sell a piece of property, what, are, what extra expenses are they going to incur to drill that well and to meet those new requirements, which shouldn't fall, it seems to me that um, as Bruce was saying, it shouldn't fall onto the people who own that land, uh, who sell that land or who drill, have to drill a new well, that that should actually be covered, uh, at least the increase part of, of a well 
ought to be covered by St. Gobain and uh, the settlement. And, and I'm not sure we really know what that is, whether that's a small percentage, whether that's a large number, uh, what those new regulations, what that impact is. I think we should know that. Um, I think Stu or, or Dan may be better able to answer this, but my understanding is that um, if someone's water becomes contaminated, someone has a well now that they're using, it becomes contaminated, then St. Cobain is responsible for paying for whatever uh, needs to happen to uh, give them potable water, but that could be a poet system. So it could be a filter, you know, going into the house and that um, as those situations are reevaluated, it may change. But um, right now it's a stepped, it's a stepped system. Um, the cost of drilling a well, uh, what I understood the DEC to say was it, it's going to be variable. It depends on what your land is like underneath. It depends on um, what year you decide to do it. It depends on who drills the well so that there, there are enough variables that um, while you could get a ballpark figure, uh, it might not, you know, it might or might not um, be accurate. So, uh, so Gary, what, so what do you have a, are you suggesting that we should ask in a letter or how will we do this that that uh, ballpark figure for what a new well is going to cost would be and if there are any remedies for moving directly to a well rather than a poet system or no i'm thinking i'm thinking more of uh if there's additional paperwork if there's additional engineering that has to happen if there's additional casing that has to happen uh, uh into into ledge what is that? What's the impact of those costs? Uh, and those can be, I mean, I know that the well changes depending upon the depth that you're digging uh, or drilling, but uh, what other things are in these regulations that make it uh, more expensive for somebody to do? And I think that we should, should be able to um, find out at least an estimate of what that cost is. So maybe explicitly state the the addition the costs including paperwork and engineering that have to happen in order to drill a, a new well who who is this for is this for um is it for the homeowner stewart's got his hand up i think he's going to save it save me here go ahead, well, go ahead. Yeah, I, I don't know i don't know that i can do that jenny uh, <laughs> but uh we could probably ask the state to identify in general, what the new uh, standards will be for well drilling. Uh, it probably will be casing. It probably will be deep well, uh, probably into the ledge, Gary. So you're, you're obviously gonna drive up the cost of drilling a well. Um, uh, I spent a summer working for Stevens and Frost up here uh, back in the day. And uh, I can tell you, um, once you get down into ledge, when you're drilling, it's a long and expensive process. So no more shallow wells into the shallow aquifer. That's, that's gonna be one of the rules, but I think the state can probably give us an idea about what those restrictions might be. Would that be suitable, Gary? I think so. I think just so we have that information Okay. Other other comments or questions from select board? I just have one more. So so I get the feeling that say you have a well, it becomes contaminated. It's not the homeowner's choice. They can't say, I don't want a POA system. I want a new well. They don't get to choose. That's unfortunate. Okay. Um, all right, and I don't see any attendees with their hand up. Um, are there are there any community members who would like to speak? No. All right. So what's the what's up? Uh, nope. There goes a hand. All right. 
Let's see. All right. 439. You're Mary, you you should be able to speak if you uh hit star nine, star six, sorry. Okay, right. can you hear me now? Sorry, yes. I wanted, forgot that I was muted. Um, just wanted to re remind folks that the PFOA public hearing is going to be for those affected, and obviously other people can listen to that meeting as well, is May Tuesday, May 11th at 6 p.m. And uh, it is um, another public hearing that we had made available. I had that made available so that the folks who are affected could have another chance to um, present, uh, you know, where the, what their thoughts are on it. Also, the deadline for written comment is, I believe it's the 28th or 29th of May. So I do recommend that um, folks uh, do either attend the meeting or write uh, a document to the state um, or do both. There were the hearings in, in North Bennington as well as Shaftesbury, and I would strongly recommend those folks if they're listening to the meeting tonight as well to do both. But thank you. I just wanted to remind everyone of the next date. Thank you, Mary. That's, that's very, very helpful. All right, so what is the board's pleasure on this? Do we want to direct, do we want to hold off until after the hearing? Do we want to uh, instruct Stu to write a letter raising the points that have been raised thus far? Does that take a motion or is that just uh... Hey, uh, Sarah has her hand up and I can see it. There so we go. Go for Even it. Even better. I, I would like to see a letter written in support of um, the individuals affected be hooked up to town water. That's my preference. Okay. Uh, anything else that you're that you are feeling is important to have in that letter? Uh, I see Bruce's hand up. No. Okay. All right. Uh, Bruce. Yes, you're up. I, I, I would. I would ask that that um, a copy of of whatever the letter is that the home hold harmless type of letter, or at least some kind of notice to all of the affected uh, homeowners. Uh, they know who they are. Um, the state knows who they are. But that get we urge them to send that out pre preemptively and not just wait to be asked. And thirdly, uh, I would like us to. I would like you to request answers to Gary's question, which I think is a very good one. Uh, a little bit more than, yeah, it's gonna cost more to do a well and you know, blah, blah, blah. We really need to know specifics um, as much as possible, in as much as they should be held as harmless as possible. All right, so we have those three items, Stu. Is that, are you comfortable with those? And I suppose, um, like you mentioned, using the funds that are available as well. Okay. All right. Uh, anything more? I see we have one more. Tina, we're gonna. Tina is gonna allow me allow you to talk. Maybe no. She has to be swished up um, to speak. Dan, can we swish her? Yeah, I just promoted her to panelist. She should. She should. Yeah, she's joined us. Thank you. Um, so I have a question. Um, uh, are with this program. Um, so will people, I'm sorry, I lost track of my thoughts. So um, could you repeat the last question by Sarah Perrin? Uh, Sarah, Sarah suggested that in addition to uh, connecting everyone possible to municipal water that we request that the uh, funds that are coming down from the federal government or infrastructure um, be that we request that those be used or some other funds. Now to, yeah, to piggyback off of that. So would this be transferable if properties or when properties are sold? You know, will these protections be transferable? Yes, 
Yes, uh, they are. Yes. For the life of, of, of all generations from yes. now until it's clean. Awesome. Yes. Yes. So That's the settlement is forever. Awesome. That's great. Whatever forever means. Yeah. In perpetuity. Okay. So, Tina, does that answer your question? It definitely does. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Super. All right. All right. So we're, so uh, do we need a motion or just a sense of the board for this? I think Sarah moved it. I'll second it. Okay. Well, Sarah, well, we've added significantly to it since then. Um, but so Sarah, do you want to, do you want to update your motion? Amanda? Sure, yeah, I will. Um, I'd like to make a motion to request that we send a letter. Um, sorry. I'm, I'm still gathering my thoughts from quite a while ago. Uh, that we request a letter to ask that the affected individuals be hooked up to town water <clears throat> and the funds matter becoming available be used to do that. All right, and also that we have um, uh, information on uh, identify the new standards and uh, what will be required to drill the deep wells. Yes. And the whole and the letter. Be and, sent to the residents. Yes, and with the addition of that, yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Bruce, are you seconding? I'll second that. Okay, perfect. All right. So please unmute yourself. Everyone in favor of that, please say aye. Oh, Jean, Jean, Jean. Do we yes. need, Stu, do we need to include any language in the letter about the ordinance change possibility? No. no? Okay. No, there am I am I not, am I muted? No, I'm not. Oh. Um, no, uh, that is that is a that is something that is being uh, moved up the chain of command uh, up at the DEC to see whether or not an ordinance would actually eliminate the need for the reclassification altogether. Uh, that's an answer the state will give us at some point in the future. All right, so good. So shall we vote on this motion then? All in favor of it, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed, please say nay. Any abstentions? Nope, okay, excellent. Thank you very much. All right, so we are ready to move on to community policing. And tonight we have two policies that Bruce is gonna walk us through. Then we have um, updated traffic stop data that Bruce is gonna talk about. And then Jean's gonna give us an update on where we are on the police department procedures. All right, Bruce, you're up. Right. Uh, these are for first reading, uh, which basically means I'll be happy to answer any questions. First one, uh, I believe, is officer and employee internet postings and social networking. Um, and uh, basically what this is attempting to do is to be instructive about um, the uh, desires of, and, and recognizing that, that while officers have free speech rights, uh, those are not just sort of universal and that they can be constrained by, because of the position they hold. Uh, they also have to remember that they have to uh, be able to testify in court and they can't do things on social media that would make that uh, impossible. Um, the items that are in yellow um, are items that uh, our town attorney highlighted, and I wanted to highlight for you, uh, and I added the term, uh, he thought that the perhaps on, on page one at line 21, uh, indicating their participation in any social uh, networking sites was a little too vague, so I, I used the term active. I'm not sure that that's going to do it, but I think it's better than than what was there before. Um, the, uh, the addition also on page two of uh, or number three, item number three under policy, um, that number three, social media networking sites shall not be used, blah, 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 um, probably is maybe of questionable enforceability, but I think um, I think it expresses really strongly what it is we expect from our police uh, officers and, and employees. 
um, that you don't do anything. Uh, you think about what your position is. It's, it's, it's what I used to say to folks in other organizations or employee groups that I was involved in. Um, try not to do things that are going to plump, plump you right on, plunk you right onto the front page of the Bennington banner in a way that you wouldn't wanna show your grandmother. Um, that's really what that's about. Whether it's enforceable or not, I almost don't care. Um, I think it expresses our, the view and it certainly expresses the view of the committee that was drafting this one. So that's that I'll take any, uh, if anybody has any questions. Um, okay, Jean. I see your hand. Boy, you do have things to say today. I know. <laughs> um, Go get them. No, it, it's, this is, I think it's just a little typo on um, the first policy officer and employee internet postings, blah, blah, line mm -hmm. 18. I think you need an S on the word accounts. Yeah. Yes. That's it. I promise I'm done. <laughs> Okay, that's because we deleted the latter part. Yes, Jeannie. Hi, so I have two quick things. On line eight, I am wondering, instead of saying such speech impacts the effectiveness, because all speech can impact the effectiveness, I'm wondering if, it, if we could say misuse of this speech impacts. So that's one suggestion. Uh, and then on page two, line six, well, line four through six. Right. So, so BPD employees must never engage in hate speech or other speech. I'd like to move on any social network to that spot. So that it says, or other speech on any social network, network that brings discredit upon um, by by having it at the end of a sentence where it is right now in six, yep. it, it, it's, it, I have trouble understanding it because it says, uh, which may undermine or result in impeachment of their testimony and illegal proceedings on any social networking. Yep, okay. I, I see, it. yep. Okay. So, so put it, tell me again, just precisely so where you think it would four, go, so where you think it would go. Yeah, line four. BP, uh -huh. employees must never engage in hate speech, comma, or other speech on any social networking site. Okay. That yep. brings discredit. Okay. Yep, that's fine. Okay, that was it. Great, thank you. Um, and let me just add to a conversation that's been going on. I actually do think we do have a code of conduct, obviously, uh, in, with the Bennington PD, or at least we're, we're working on, we're redrafting it. Uh, when, and we have a redraft in the works that you'll eventually see. Um, I would say that that is not the same thing as a code of ethics. Um, and, and my, um, let me, uh, I, I can quickly just say that the code of ethics, I think is, a, is an even broader umbrella of these are the principles that we've actually, foundational things that we believe in. Uh, and I actually think the Bennington PD has a document that fashions very much like, or functions very much that way, even now. It's just not one that anybody has adopted. So um, we can work on that, I think. Okay. Uh, and that may resolve that. Conduct is drawn from, the code of conduct is drawn from a code of ethics. This is the way the IACP sees it anyway. So Bruce, why don't you, you may want to hold that conversation until we get to code of, of conduct. Right. I, I just, I will say it if only because it's referred to up above in okay. the in the reference. That's why oh. I, I raised it. Okay. And Can it's I... been raised, it's been referenced in a number of others. Okay. Um, so um, we but... have one we have one attendee question. Oh. Okay. Sure. Um, Dan, we're gonna have to move uh, Tina up. Hi, Thank Tina. you. Um, so do we have any language about um, social media use while on duty? I couldn't find it. This is social media use, whether you're on duty or not on duty. You, you, you're not free to just use social media while you're on duty anyway. But so this would refer to any social media use, whether you're on duty or 
in other words, let me put it this way, Tina. Um, I actually think that the notion, and, and I think Dan uh, Ferrara would back me up on this, the sort of separation that we in the civilian world think of as being on duty and off duty isn't really a distinction. They're, they are held to the same conduct levels, whether they're, whether they're uh, they certainly shouldn't be on social media when they're patrolling, because that you can't do. Um, well, I know that um, corporations do put this language in there. Right. But, but that's because corporations work on it. I will put it this way. Let me put it sort of this way. And the, I mean, it's an interesting question, and it's one that I can actually take back to the committee. Uh, but corporations, when I'm working for the corporation, let's say uh, if I was working for Energizer, um, they would have one rule about that, and it would be an entirely different matter when I wasn't in the building working for them. Um, police officers don't, are not supposed to be functioning that way. Um, they're actually police officers 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And that's how the statute gets read in Vermont. So this would count, all, in fact, all of our policies would count no matter what. And that's what Dan, I think, has said over and over again. But if you'd like something more specific, let's say, about on-duty use of social media that's not duty related, um, email me and we'll and we can work out some language perhaps that I could then share with the rest of the drafting committee. I wonder if there's um, a national standard. I will definitely research. Actually, that. this is where the this this document really reflects the national standard from the IACP. Be That's interesting to pursue. Yeah. Thank that, you for oh, not a problem. Be yep, happy to do that. Can we move on to the next one? Everybody ready? The other one is um, special. Oh, this is something that we have not had before. This is so. This is new to us, and it really is reflective. Um, it's the um, special events, and it it's a it's an attempt to regularize what is now an occasional practice, and so it's regularizing. Uh, and the places where um, our town attorney suggested we might, um, the one place that I knew he wanted us to be thinking about is, is there a size issue here? I mean, and what, and what, what size of event? And I know that the um, committee thought about that and thought about that, and I'm not sure we came to anything. So if you would look at line 14, uh, and 15 of, of page one um, that says where more than 50 persons are expected to attend. That is a number wholly out of my, um, the right side of my brain. And, and you should not take that as having any more authority than that. Um, so I had it there essentially as a placeholder. Um, I've had some communication with people on the committee and they think 50 is fine. Others think 20 would be a better number. Um, I, I remain clueless on this one and I'm happy to accept any and all suggestions. Eventually we'll have to make a determination. Any, uh, any questions, comments? Jean. Surprise, surprise. Um, I don't know how to say this, uh, but I'll, I'm just going to say it. Let's say it. it. It depends on what 20 people or what 50 people. Do you know what I mean? Well, that was our thought. I, I know what you mean. I mean, it depends in part about what we're talking about. You could have 300 people. That would be less of an issue than 20 people in some but, instances. But if you look at, uh, okay, Jean, I'll, I'll give you that. I just think if you look at the purpose behind this, it's really to help the organizer of the event communicate and plan 
with the PD so that the PD is already prepared and they know exactly who to communicate with. So I think we do have to have an, probably a number um, or no number and say, everybody has to do it uh, if it's a planned event, which I'm not really fond of. So I would rather us have a number. And you know, the idea is so that, so that at a, um, the food truck event or the uh, gay pride parade or I mean, we were thinking of any number of, of events that happen and that utilize public property. Um, oh, the other place that the town attorney suggested was, what about private property? And um, I think I added that nothing, I added the lines on 17 and 18, nothing in this policy will change what the police can do with regard to disturbances on or, you know, maintaining all that on private property. So if, they're, if they need to be called into private property, this doesn't change that. It only deals with public events on public property. And it's really an advanced planning idea. It's to get organizers to communicate and sit down and plan and then debrief at the end saying what went well, what didn't work, what could we do better? Which and I there's, think no, there's no requirement for the purpose of the event. Demonstration. No. No. Because I don't think I don't think we. De, um, I de, I can't imagine that we would want to be in the business of trying to determine what's an appropriate purpose of an event. No, I, I'm not saying you would determine it was inappropriate or appropriate. That's that's subjective, and that's that's not. Proper. It's also a First Amendment issue. It's a First Amendment, right? Exactly. But I was just thinking to in, to be able to prepare appropriately, it may be good to know what the purpose would is of the gathering is. Not to not to refuse it, but just to be prepared. Well, that I mean, I think that's what the conversation between whoever at the PD is working on this and and their applicant they can ask that question in an application that they will prepare. Perfect, didn't know That's that. That's part of the procedure. Didn't know that, okay. Sorry. Uh, Sarah. So I think this is what Gina was getting at, but if, you're, if this is what you were getting at, please just say, Sarah, that's totally not it. Um, so the concern that I had is if, some, if there's a peaceful protest, something like that, against the town or you know concerns with the town, police department, uh, that's my concern. You know, they giving a fee to the police when somebody is doing a protest against the police. They've that done that before. Counterintuitive to me. I, I I will just say I I know for a fact that that was done before. Because I because I made I made the content. Right. I mean, that just seems counterintuitive to me. It's just I don't know. It just doesn't feel right to me. And I, I've got to say that I want to get that off my chest. It just seems sure. counterintuitive. Perfectly. I don't. I don't take it personally. Sure. No, no, I know. But I just yeah, I want to say that. It just seems very counterintuitive. Right. But actually, in many many communities across the country, and many places where I've lived, it's really even when the purpose of the demonstration is going to in, is going to be demonstrating against uh, some activity of the police department, uh, it was always helpful to, to let the police department know that that's what you're gonna be doing. Yeah, I, I agree it, it, um, to let somebody know that's gonna happen, but to pay somebody when you're not, not- paying, well, okay, you may not, there may not be any fee at all because it may not involve any, you're not asking them for protection. Okay, all right. You have, no, you will have this one is gonna have to wait for a lot of the procedure to come out. So you know what, what the application format will be that the okay. police department has. You know, if we're doing a demonstration down at the Four Corners, there's no cost to the police and therefore no fee. Okay, no, I just saw the warrior fee schedule and I just, and yep. then a demonstration and just, I just, I've got to get this out in the meeting and just say, this does not feel right to me. Okay, and you and I can talk about it some more if we want. 
Anything else? Yes, Jeannie. Hi. Um, so I have a couple things. So one, I was a little confused. I assumed in the beginning that, that demonstrations were covered under special events, but I see they are both identified, they're both, they have separate definitions and under the purpose, we separate out special events and demonstrations. So I'm wondering if the title should be special events and demonstrations. Uh, because we do seem to not, we differentiate between special events and demonstrations right. throughout here. Okay, so that's, that's one thing. Um, second, I think I would probably be in favor of reducing the 50 to maybe 30 or something, some, something along those lines. 50 people is a lot of people for four corners, for instance. I agree. You know? um, uh, and then under crowd control, um, if, I, I guess I would, I would like um, additional language. So I'm thinking under crowd control, something like techniques used to ensure the safety of those at an event by addressing civil dis disturbances to include a show of force, that sort of thing. I think I would like to explain why we're doing crowd control. Yep, um, I think that's helpful. Okay, and then uh, just a typo in line 16 with liaison. Uh, and that is it. Oh, oh, one more thing. Um, under demonstration on line nine, would it be helpful uh, to say these may be, but not limited to scheduled events that allow for law enforcement planning? Sure. That's it. I don't want to. I don't want to lose your comments. All right. Anything else on those two policies? So we don't need a motion on this. Oh, Tom's got his hand up. Sorry. Go ahead, Tom. Hi, Tom. Yeah. Hi. I just was. Uh, I wanted to make clear that there may be a, um, situations where folks want to demonstrate what have you that are very spur of the moment. Yeah. Um, and this, I don't, and nothing I see here actually prevents anyone from doing that. It's more. Exactly. Right. They don't. Okay. Yep. If, if I call up 20 of my friends to demonstrate on some topic um, tomorrow night at five, I don't have to do a thing. Right. Okay. And that was intentional. Thanks. Good. Great. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. So I can't remember. Do we, can we? That's it. Done with first reading? Okay. Done. Great. All right. On to traffic stop information. Okay. Um, I think you asked me to do this. Um, in the packet you've got, and the public can see uh, a document that I uh, uh, put together in uh, utilizing the data that's, uh, that we got a couple, six weeks or so ago from the chief, as well as data from the um, police department's website. Part of the reason for having this is so that folks will know that there is such a uh, thing as uh, a data tab on the police department's website. And I encourage everybody to go there. Um, this was accomplished uh, really with a lot of the work from um, Cam Grandy. Uh, and uh, he looked over my documentation here. Um, there, you may note uh, that there might be more uh, either civil complaints or warnings in total than there are actual stops. And that's because you can get multiple, you can get a warning on something and a uh, civil ticket. Um, or you can get multiple tickets. Um, but uh, about half of the stops, you can actually see if you go onto the site, and I encourage anybody who's still listening to this meeting to do that, um, and to see exactly where these take place. Uh, you can actually, if there is a search, you can actually see what was the basis for the search. Uh, you can actually see whether it was based on probable cause or what based, based on consent. Um, and then I broke down uh, the uh, stops by 
the total number of stops by the race of the drivers, and also the total number of searches, 42, uh, based on the driver's uh, racial classifications. Um, you could also find out, uh, if you were so inclined, whether the search produced any um, um, contraband, if you want. So not all searches produce contraband, uh, but you can find out essentially from the list there. And this is uh, well before the state is even going to be asking for them. They don't ask until November. So uh, I did want people to see that. Um, I'm not sure I know. I don't have any way to uh, say whether 3,463 stops is a high number or a low number. Um, um, but I, I will note that in Vermont, officers tend to be stopping people at substantial rates. And for whatever reason, I am not sure. Um, so I, I reserve judgment on that, but I thought people ought to have this information and the whole committee did as well. Thank you, Bruce. That was that was a great summary of that of that data. So yes, please. There's a data tab and on the police department website, and um, all this information is there. So Jean, you are up next. Yeah, very briefly. Um, I got an update from Dan this morning. We have had 15 separate comments that have come in um, on the procedures that are posted. And that's not 15 different people, um, 15 comments. I just wanna make that clear. And um, there, the comment period will be open until five o'clock on April 28th, which is what, Wednesday. So that's where we are in that process. Perfect, thank you. Any questions before we move on? Nope, okay, perfect. All right, so number eight, loan application for three pressure reducing valves. Stu, you are definitely up. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you have in your packet the, the memorandum and a copy of the loan application. This is relatively straightforward. Uh, we have one pressure reducing valve that is currently located in Burgess Road uh, that is very, very critical condition and needs to be replaced. Uh, when we began to look at that with our engineers, uh, it, it came to everyone's idea that we should pro probably take a look at the other two pressure re reducing valves in the system to see whether or not they too may need some work. So what this loan application contemplates is a design step one and two of three projects uh, more than likely just two when you get down to it. Uh, one would be to, to redesign the and relocate the pressure reducing valve on Burgess Road um, and potentially look to include an electric, electrical generating turbine within the pressure reducing valve itself. Uh, the second major project, and it's not probably not major, would be look at the Willow Park pump station. Uh, the turbine there is, is in fairly good condition, uh, but that also could, you could consider adding a turbine uh, to that uh, pump station, which would generate electricity for the town in both those situations. Uh, it now appears just preliminarily, and we'll confirm this when the design is completed, that the Fillmore Street uh, pressure reducing valve does not need uh, much work, just some maintenance, and is uh, really too small for a turbine. So. Uh, what I need from the board tonight is just a motion to authorize the chair to sign the application. And then once that is done, uh, uh, yours truly as the authorized rep and the town clerk must also sign. And then this goes in. We're talking about a total uh, fund application here of $27,906. It does uh, open the door for access to a total of over 400,000 should we go in that direction. Thank you, Stuart. Do I have a motion to that effect? I'll move. I authorize the uh, chair to sign on our behalf and for Stuart to sign as the representative. Second. Second. Thank you, Tom. 
<laughs> All right, so please unmute yourself. All in favor of this motion, please say aye. 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 All opposed, please say nay. Any abstentions? All right, thank you. Let's, that's great, let's move on. All right, so next up we have boards and commissions and there are a couple things we need to do on this. Um, Stuart has shared the list of town boards and commissions and looks like we have 16 seats coming up in May. What we know is that traditionally some people who are holding the seat now will reapply and, and want to keep that seat and others may decide you know, that uh, they're opening it up for someone new. Um, we also have a board that's listed in our packet that is not actually an official uh, board for year two, and that would be the energy, uh, the energy commission, the Ener energy board. Sorry, uh, I would um, I would ask that the energy committee has done really great work this year that we uh, add them to the list of official town boards. Uh, I would also ask that we keep it at a seven member board that seemed to work very well, including a select board representative as one of those seven. And then also that we set staggered terms uh, so that uh, they don't all come up again next year. Um, so I'm uh, wondering if I could have a motion to that effect. I'll move that. <clears throat> Can you. we also, as, do we need to, we need to come up with some sort of text for yes. them. Okay, yeah, yes. So, so can we second and then let, let's, yeah, yeah. Let, let's do some discussion. I'll second that. Okay, okay. So now open for discussion. Um, so we'll need, yes, yeah, so we'll need text for them, which I think we um, will have to amend that first year charge. So we will need text and we also will need to determine what kind of staggered terms. Um, I don't know if we want to do like four, two year, two, three year, and then a select a one year select board appointment. That, that makes more sense to me right there. Um, okay. four, four, three, three fours, three threes, yeah, and a one. Yeah, we can do that. Um, all right, any other thoughts about anything before we vote on this? No, all right, so. Uh, let's, could I have a show of hands, all of who uh, approve adding the energy committee with staggered terms, seven person, one select board member, please say aye. 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 Any, uh, all opposed? Abstentions. And Jim, I think I missed your hand. Did you have something that you wanted to say on that? My apologies. No. You asked us to raise our hand oh. rather than say aye, so I just raised my little yellow hand. <laughs> thank, thank you, Jim. Thank you. All right. Okay. So, all right. So, yay, the Energy Committee is now added to our town boards. Um, we have, so we need to set, we need to determine who we're going to interview and set a, a date to interview candidates. Um, generally in the past, we have not interviewed candidates that are reapplying for the same position or have been long-term board members. Um, but what's the pleasure of the board? What would you like to do? I think we should do the same thing, not interview people that have been on the, on, um, been seated on a board already. Okay, okay. Anyone have any other thoughts on that? All right, seeing none. Uh, so assuming we are only interviewing new board members, um, would it work to do Zoom interviews on Monday, May 17th at six, which is our, our off Monday? If it doesn't, we'll take this offline and find a and, and do a doodle poll or something. Yeah, Gina, you may, yeah, may, you may not want to set that date yet. Um, okay. this, will be, this will be posted. Okay. And so that'll, and, and obviously the, the people who work with these committees will be not letting them folks know that the reappointment process has begun. So okay. we, we may want to hold off until 
uh, either May 31st or no, that's more. Oh, okay. isn't it? <laughs> we can, we'll, we'll figure it out. Okay. All right. Is there a, a closing date for the um, applications? Uh, we should, yes, we'll, we'll we'll post it for so that they uh, apply uh, no later than uh, how about something like May twentieth. Okay. Tuesday. Does that, work, does that work for everybody? All right, and then we'll set a we'll set an interview date after that. All right, and there's no problem because board members will continue to serve until until reappointed or or until they are replaced. Okay. Perfect. All right. Great. Thank you. All right, then Stuart, you are up next with the manager's report. What do you have for us tonight? Um, one action item for you. Uh, last year, uh, in, in and about this time, uh, we voted to waive the interest on delinquent water sewer payments uh, from January 2020 until December 31st, 2020. Uh, we have done so. Uh, the last water bill for this current fiscal year has just gone out, uh, and I'm, I don't have the date, but I'm, it'll be due by the end of June. So within this fiscal year, uh, we will be continuing to waive those delinquencies that occur. Um, my finance director has asked me what we do for the ensuing fiscal year. And I am recommending that we reinstate the interest on delinquent water sewer fees beginning July 1 of 2021. Does anyone have any concern about doing that? Tom, you have your hand up. Uh, do we have a, an idea of how many people this affects? Uh, not off the top of my head, Tom. It, 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 Costs us about five to six thousand dollars annually uh, to do this. Um, if I'm remembering what Melissa tells me, um, and interestingly enough, we thought we would see a greater delinquency last uh, last year, and it did not occur. And I don't know whether that's because of the COVID assistance that has been given to homeowners and businesses, but we didn't see a tremendous amount of people missing their water payments. So. I don't think we lost a lot of money, um, uh, but I don't see any reason to continue to do it uh, if in fact people are able to afford it and, and pay their water sewer fees. Sarah, you had a question. Yeah, I, I think um, I was just thinking about this when I, I read this and I was just, you know, I, I, we did not expect this to go on as long as this has, but, um, it might make sense to say at the conclusion of the state of emergency. That's my thought. Is that possible, Stu? What, what of course. That? Yeah, it's all, uh, yes. And you, you tell me the date, uh, we can do it. Um, I, we, I generally think in terms of fiscal years, but that's, that's because I work in terms of fiscal years. But um, yes, I, if, if in fact the governor's projection of July 4th as, as the magic date, uh, then we'd be right on um, and no problem. If it continues until September, I don't think that hurts us at all. It's another quarter. So if that's, if that's the motion, I'll, I, I'd be glad to put that into play. All right. Sarah, do you wanna make that as a motion? Um, I, I, you know, hopefully it doesn't go past July 4th, but um, do, do you think that makes sense just to put in at the conclusion of state at the conclusion of the state emergency? Yeah, yeah. What we would do is we would we would probably go since we bill quarterly, we'd probably carry it through to the end of whatever quarter we were in. Okay. Reinstate at the end of the quarter. And then possibly just revisit if. Uh, it, I'm looking for a motion so that I have a date, somewhat certain in which to. Okay. So I don't have to come back again and and ask once again. Okay, so hopefully we won't have to revisit it, but yeah. yeah. So the motion is, so, and I see Jean has her hand up. Uh, so the motion is to extend the, uh, uh, extend waiving interest on delinquent water and sewer payments until the end of the pandemic emergency. Yes, yeah, to extend into the conclusion of state of emergency. 
I would second that. Jean, were you um, were you seconding something, or were you did you have a comment? Yeah, I just I just want to know, and and this has really nothing to do with the vote, so I can wait if you want me to. Um, yeah, why don't it, let, let's vote then? Okay. Okay. So it's been firsted and seconded. So all in favor of the motion, please say aye, Jim. Aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. Any abstentions? All right, great, thank you. All right, go ahead, Jean. Yeah, I just wondered, um, Stu, if people are really struggling at any time, nothing to do with COVID, but let's just say we have a resident who's really struggling to pay their water bill, um, they can set up some sort of a payment plan. There's, there's options for them anytime. Anytime, yes. We, we, we can set up any kind of a payment plan. We can work with people. Uh, we can delay payments if they need to. Remember, we don't, we don't charge a penalty on delinquent water and sewer fees on a quarterly basis. So it's really only the interest that, that impacts them. And that's at 1% per month, uh, which is a statutory uh, interest rate. Um, so yeah, we, we work with the same thing with taxes. We work with anybody that's having some trouble. Great. Thank you, Jane. That was a good question. All right, Stu, back to you. Okay. Uh, down below in the informational piece, uh, I talk about sidewalk construction, and it was a paving cost comparison that, that RJ uh, Jolly, our public works director, put together for, for Dan and I. Uh, it, it, it presents an interesting uh, opportunity here, I think, one to save costs two, to speed construction projects, uh, and three, perhaps to enhance the uh, ADA experience that people have when using the sidewalks in Bennington. Uh, it appears, based on the, the work that RJ has put into it, that there is substantial savings by using asphalt pavement and curbing when doing sidewalk work uh, versus using concrete. One, you don't have the expansion joint issue. Uh, you don't have um, uh, concrete, of course, is very expensive. It also takes time to cure. It's a lot harder to put down and get a nice even surface. Uh, and therefore projects take longer to do. Uh, our suggestion here is, is that if we look perhaps at the uh, downtown district or slash the historic district, which are slightly different, that within those districts, we leave concrete uh, sidewalks in play uh, and perhaps we carry them out along some of our class three collector streets uh, to a point certain. Uh, Elm Street is one of those streets that is uh, comes to mind. Otherwise, beyond that, well, outside that area, when replacing sidewalks, we would use asphalt and curb uh, or asphalt and a grass strip, depending on how much width you have for paving and for other construction techniques. Um, we're, we're obviously in the upper Dewey Street area now doing water line extensions and, and, and a lot of work. The sidewalk there is in pretty tough shape. And one of the questions that, that RJ has is, can I put that sidewalk in as asphalt with curb? Uh, it'll save us money. It'll give us a smoother surface. And we're finding that if done right, asphalt services last longer than one would anticipate and they are easier to replace uh, and less expensive to replace. So I, I put that to you. Um, if you. If you want us to take it seriously, we'll come up with a map that we propose for you so that you know exactly what neighborhoods might be impacted. Because I know in the past, we've talked about this with prior select boards and they were adamant that if anything within the village, you weren't gonna do anything but concrete. Um, so if, if you'd like me to do that, we will do that. We'll have it on the May 10th. We'll come back with a plan that uh, you folks can say yay or nay to. Does that make sense? I think um, I, I would be in favor of that. I see we have Jim, then Tom. So you guys speak up. Thank you. Um, the only 
Well, Jim, we can't well, hear you. a couple you. concerns. Jim, um, you know, for any kid who grew up in Bennington or anywhere, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yeah, I got better? you. Go yeah. ahead. Okay. Um, you know, for any kid who ever went barefoot in the summer on blacktop, uh, you never forget it. Um, you know, it burnt your feet. And uh, if, you, if you're walking a dog, it's going to burn their feet. But, you know, Stu, in, in my uh, early college years, I worked on the highway crew. And uh, what was done um, to ameliorate that was, you know, the blacktop was laid down, then a coating of tar, and then um, keystone on it, um, which made it more reflective and um, less hot. So um, I'd like you to in include that uh, in um, your deliberations on that. We can do that. Thanks. My turn? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, just briefly, I mean, you say it's less expensive. Is, are we talking a lot less expensive, a little less expensive? I mean, I'll, obviously all savings are going to hopefully accumulate, but. Uh, we're talking, uh, if you look in your, at the back of your packet in the manager's report, concrete has a cost per lineal foot of $19.64. Hot mix has a total cost per lineal foot of $9.88. Oh, yeah. So we're, we're talking about substantial difference. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, I would totally be in favor of, um, of I, I see Gary's after me, uh, of talking about this with RJ um, next meeting. It does sound like it's a, it's a very, uh, it is a trade-off between aesthetics and um, cost savings. So I think a map would be really nice. Uh, also, I think if you could um, give us some ideas of where, maybe in the packet so that people can do this before the meeting, where the hot mix is being used so we can see what hot mix looks like, uh, that, would, oh. that would be helpful. Um, I get, right off the top of my head, the best example that I would, I would offer you is uh, as you go up South Street uh, beyond um, Crescent Boulevard, uh, there's an asphalt sidewalk that takes you up to the cemetery. And that's been in place a long time. Okay. Sure, that's it, probably 20 plus years installed. And what is the, is it hot mix um, at Bennington College going over to Hannaford or is that something different? No, that's yeah, hot mix. Okay. Okay. It's it, Jeannie, it's the same material that we use on streets. It's pavement. Well, it's all I know, and I hate to say this out loud, but whatever was put down at the bottom of Imperial Avenue before the sidewalk restoration was happening, um, looked like straight asphalt and it was very unattractive. So, um, so. Oh, I see, because it was p patched in. Yeah. It was patched in, yeah. So, yeah, so that's why I'm trying to figure it out. That, that probably was, that probably was cold mix. So it wasn't actually <laughs> the right material for a permanent solution. But, okay, yeah. great. All right, thank you. Gary, your turn. As um, many of you know, I walk uh, Sophie the dog <laughs> every day, a lot on the sidewalks. And Jim's point about the, the heat uh, that is accumulated in the summertime from sun on pavement um, will be an issue for people like me and, and other people who are walking their dogs. So I, I just, I think having a map, knowing where this might be um, would, be, uh, would be very helpful. And, and I don't know if the P stone is, an, is uh, if you could actually use like that, uh, that mix, but it doesn't seem like that works on a sidewalk. That's not a realistic option, unfortunately. It's not what yeah. they, yeah. they do nowadays. So, I mean, we could look at whether there's binders that are, that are a different color or something like that, but it'd be interesting. It was, Dan, it was a realistic uh, enough uh, use for the town to have done it for 20 or 30 years on on our rural roads. Uh, okay. Don't take my word. Talk to Roger Cross. Oh, I no, know Jim. Jim, Jim. I'm very familiar with that. It's just not as durable material. 
it, yeah, that, yeah, that's a that's an oil enough. that's an oil and peastone mix. It's 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 good for doing a quick surface job, Jim, but it does not it does not have the the stability nope. that asphalt does. But you're, Stu, I think, Stu, you're missing. Hang on, you're misunderstanding me because I, and I was a witness. I did, I had the the tire on the bottom of my shoes that I couldn't go into my mother's house with. Um, we laid down blacktop first, then there was a layer of um, tar, and then pea stone was laid down, and then it, uh, the uh, yeah. the roller came out and embedded it in, in the blacktop. Yeah, yeah. It, my, my recollection, Jim, would that, that would be a shim coat added to a road to, to level the surface and then the, uh, so other surface treatment go on. Uh, it, it was a fast way to do black topping without having to use all asphalt. But okay, surface temp is an issue. I get the I get that point. All right. So Gary, is that a new hand or an old hand for you? Sorry, it was an old hand. Okay. All right. <laughs> so any more any more questions? All right. So uh, um, so we'll have it on next. Yep. Meeting we'll, we'll get we'll get back to you the next next time and we'll try to have a, a solution to that surface temperature okay that would be great all right well and that leads right into upcoming agendas so we will have sidewalk pavement on the agenda uh we have two second readings one for social media and one for special events and hopefully we'll have a first reading of one additional policy um, I understand we'll have subcommittees recommendations on public comment for that meeting as well. And then sometime either that meeting or an upcoming meeting, we will have uh, we, the opioid response team update and data collection, um, which is thank you very much, Sarah, for, for working on that. Um, also, Jeannie, yeah, uh, we, well. <laughs> we will have a... Um, uh, cert certification and attestation of the select board regarding the conveyance of uh, real estate and trust, which is the sale of the CLR uh, has now been pretty much finalized. We, we must now actually certify and attest to our uh, support of that. And that, that should be fairly quick, uh, but it'll be there. All right, okay. That's great. Anything else that we know of that should be on that agenda? Just so the people listening at home uh, can <laughs> get ready. All right. Yes, Jean. What about um, the public comment? Any any of the suggestions that the subcommittees? Yeah. Yes, okay. the subcommittee's recommendations on public comment. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes, it's on. All right. Anything else? I don't have anything. All right. Great then. All right. So then let's move to other business. Shall we go down the row alphabetically? Bruce, you have anything for us tonight? No, I don't. Okay. Anybody else? Jean. Yeah. Um, first of all, Dan. Was Dan amongst us? Yeah. Dan, um, it's so exciting that these trails are really making progress. And when we can, I would love to be able to take a field trip, especially to see the one going from Orchard Village to Molly Stark. That would be really fun to do. Okay. And then the other thing, I just want to mention, um, you know, the spring comes and the snow melts and we're all looking so forward to it until you see all the garbage that's been under the snow. And I, I mean, I'm old enough to remember and came from New Jersey where if you littered, you got a ticket if you got caught. The amount of garbage that is on our roadways, I find it is just so depressing and so sad that we can't, I find myself not even being able to enjoy the snow melting. So I would really encourage people, if you're gonna litter, please hang on to whatever it is you're gonna throw, it, throw on the ground and carry it to the next closest garbage can that, and, and throw it in there. The, the planet would, would appreciate it. All the people that live here would appreciate it. It can't make you feel good. And just imagine if we didn't need Green Up Day. I, 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 I th that is something that I long for is to not have to go pick up garbage, but we do. And it's May 1st, 
this year um, and we can pick up our bags outside the town office. Is that true, Stu? Yes, I believe that is, yes. When will they be out room. there? Uh, I'll, I'm, I'm hoping that Dan's gonna answer that question. They have to call in and get that because we only have a limited amount. So you call okay. in and we'll let you know when they're gonna be out there for you to pick up with your name on them. Okay, okay. Thank, thank you. you Dan. Anyone else? Anyone else have anything for um, other business? Seeing none. All right. We have need for executive session this evening to discuss litigation. We will be taking action on a matter of litigation and tend to come out to after we discuss this issue to take action. So um, our intention is to be in executive session for around 20 minutes. So we will not come back for 20 minutes and we'll be as close to that as we can be. Do I have a motion to go into executive session? So move. Second. Second. Excellent. Uh, so please unmute yourself. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Please say no. Any abstentions? Nope. Okay. So. We will say uh, good night for 20 minutes to uh, attendees and uh, all of our other guests. Uh, so TV. blackboard only and needed staff. <clears throat> so I would ask Jeannie, um, folks that are attendees and, and CAT TV, if you'll sign off now, because if I do remove you from the meeting, then you won't be able to sign back in. So please um, sign out uh, and then uh, in 20 minutes, which according to my watch, would be just about 9.15. We'll be back and you can, you can sign in. So we had one attendee, now they're gone. Um, huh. All right, um, I'm calling this meeting back into motion. We have to uh, have a, uh, a motion yeah, here, to, leave, select, to leave yeah. executive session. May I, may I make a motion that we uh, enter, or that we leave executive session and enter into regular session at this time? Great. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. All right. Um, Stu, are you taking notes? I am. Thank you. All Josh, right. All those with... in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. Any opposed? No. Okay. Josh right. from Kathy Via, you, can you confirm that you're with us? Josh. Okay, good. Thank so, you, Josh. Are, are you Thank you for your patience. Now? Josh, are we live now? Let me. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, so I'm calling this meeting back to order. We have one action item. Uh, I would like to ask for a motion to accept the settlement of a complaint brought against, brought before the Human Rights Commission by Kaya Morse, James Lawton, and JL against the town of Bennington and the Bennington Police Department. Do I have a motion? So move. Thank you, Bruce. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you, Jean. All right. Please unmute yourself. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. Any abstentions? All right. So thank you. We have accepted the settlement agreement. Now I'm going to read the settlement agreement. It's a little over three pages long. All right. So following mediation with the assistance of Michael Marks Esquire, the parties signing below have reached the following settlement agreement in reference to all the issues arising out of or related to the following dispute. Rakaya Morse, James Lawton and JL versus the town of Bennington, VHRC case number PA19-0012. PA 19-00013 and PA 19-0014 claim. The parties have, shall exchange the documents and payments required to implement the following. Number one, approval of agreement. This agreement is contingent upon 
approval by the Town of Bennington Select Board no later than April 26, 2021. If not approved, then this settlement shall be null and void. This agreement is also contingent upon approval of the, the withdrawal of the complaints at issue and the claim by Vermont Human Rights Commission no later than April 30th, 2021. If not approved, then this agreement shall be null and void. If this agreement is approved as described in this paragraph, the party shall take the remaining steps required by this agreement. Number two, final resolution of claim. The parties hereby resolve the claim with prejudice. No suit may be filed related to the claim. Each side shall bear its own costs and attorney's fees. Each party shall retain its rights under the law to release and publicly discuss the HRC investigative report related to the claim. Number three, general release, hold harmless and discharge of liens. The claimants shall provide the town of Bennington and all of its agents, contractors, employees, and indemnitors with the general release and hold harmless agreement in a form reasonably acceptable to all counsel. The claimant shall be responsible for obtaining any requisite approvals for the release by the minor claimant. The general release shall include an acknowledgement that the release shall not be deemed an admission of liability or the strength or weakness of any claim and that the claim is being settled to avoid expensive and protracted litigation. The general release shall cover all claims, including any claims for attorney's fees that were or could have been raised by the claimants for any reason, including claims for medical payments and a hold harmless agreement extending to all liens of any nature, extending to any unknown, undiscovered and undiscoverable claims and all persons who could in any way be subjected to these claims, including principals, members, employees, agents, officers, shareholders, indemnitors, and insurers. The claimants shall also agree to pay all liens out of the settlement proceeds. Number four, payment. Within 14 days of receipt of the signed release, the claimant shall receive a total settlement of $137,500 in a check from the indemnitor for the town of Bennington, made payable to the lawyer trust account of counsel for the benefit of the claimants in the lawsuit. Number five, other agreements. The town will work with legal aid with the goal of providing space for Vermont legal aid or other pro bono legal services, legal service providers to use space at no cost for a period of at least five years. The lease terms need to be negotiated. However, no rent shall be paid only recoupment of utilities, insurance costs, and actual out-of-pocket expenses. B, the town will continue to work in public process to prepare for public comment a proposal to provide police oversight. The town will accept public comment and specifically the input of the ACLU prior to executing a contract with a consultant for this process. There will be a structured public process to seek comments from community before a final proposal is adopted. Note, uh, a note is added saying town cannot commit to a particular solution without completing a public process. And then uh, before I read C, I just wanna say that not everyone was allowed to be part of the settlement agreement. So um, uh, both from the select board side and from uh, the town side. And I do wanna say that the full select board and the uh, town management support the statement I am about to read. So C, the town will provide the following public apology. No one in Bennington should feel unsafe or unprotected. We have listened to Kaya Morse, James Lawton and their family in mediation. It is clear that Kaya, James and their family felt unsafe and unprotected by the town of Bennington. We have to do better by all persons who live in work in or travel through the town of Bennington, irrespective of color, race, religion, and other categories as protected by law. The town of Bennington apologizes to Kaya Morse, James Lawton, and their family for the harms and trauma they encountered while residing in Bennington. And we fully acknowledge this reality. 
we pledge to learn, to do better, and to protect all of our citizens. Number six, miscellaneous. This agreement represents a compromise to avoid litigation. By making this agreement, no party makes any admission concerning the strength or weakness of any claim or position. This agreement is a comprehensive agreement. All prior understandings and discussions are merged into this agreement. This agreement may only be amended by a written instrument signed by all parties. The parties shall execute such additional documents as are reasonably requested to implement this agreement. This agreement shall be interpreted under the laws of the state of Vermont. All parties are represented by counsel in the drafting of this agreement. All parties voluntarily made this agreement in compliance with the legal advice of their counsel. The presumption against the drafter shall not apply to the construction of this agreement. Any participation by the mediator in the drafting of this agreement was in his capacity as mediator in recording mutually agreeable settlement terms and does not constitute legal advice to any of the parties. Photocopies of this agreement shall be as effective as the original. The agreement shall be binding and enforceable against the successors, heirs, and assigns of the parties. Dated April 14th, 2021, signed by Kaya Morse, individually and as guardian for JL, James Lawton, individually and as guardian for JL, Stuart Hurd, agent for all defendants in lawsuit and their indemnitor, uh, Vermont League of Cities and Towns and Passive, and Robert Appel, Esquire, Council for Claimants, and Mick Letty, Esquire, Council for Defendants in Claim. Our hope is that this agreement will provide some much needed healing for our community and help us to move forward in achieving our town vision. So in that, I wanna thank you all for uh, staying with us through the end of this meeting and we will adjourn tonight and see you again on May 10th. Could I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Thank you, Tom. Second? Second. Second. All right, thank you, Gary. All right, good night, everyone. Good night.